Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, show this. Welcome to the Tommy Talk. My name is Juan. This is my true partner, Anthony. This is a judo podcast for judo players by two judo players. So, Anthony, how you been? I am like sore from yesterday. Like, sore? <laughs> yeah, my neck is kind of <laughs> like sore. I had to put on, I use this like CBD cream that kind of is, mm-hmm. is like a pain reliever and um, reduces inflammation. And I put it on my neck. Yeah. And that's why I'm able to move my neck now. But, ooh, I just unplugged my <laughs> headphone. <laughs> so you can't hear me then. Give me a second. All right. <laughs> But do, yeah, do, still do, very do. sore. I think um, I volunteered to be uh, uke for a private lesson that Sensei was giving. So I, mm-hmm. I was taking like falls over and over and over again. Then we had the, the beginners class and then had the kids class. So I'm just like overall, I think I, I think I took close to like you're, two to three hundred falls yesterday. So you're at the dojo a long time yesterday, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I love being on the mats, and I mean. Uh, there's no, nowhere else I'd rather be. So, yeah, well, it's good because we did finally get back into our dojo. So we've been back inside what, uh, two, three weeks now we're back inside the dojo. Yeah. It's two, three weeks. Uh, April, yeah. no, May, May 17th, April 17th. Was that? I don't remember. No, it wasn't April. I think it was the first week of May. We went back inside the dojo. First week of May, May. Yeah. May 11th or May 12th. Yeah. I think it was around there. All right. So it's been, yeah, yeah two weeks, two and a half weeks. Yeah. So we're lucky. We actually get to go back inside our dojo, mm-hmm. use our mats. You know, we have this beautiful subfloor at our dojo. So we have, we have this great cushion there and but our, we use, uh, what is it? Competition style, t- uh, two inch tatamis. So it's mm-hmm. great. It's much better than being thrown outside on some little foam mats on concrete. <laughs> I love being inside oh, the dojo. Man. That was hurt. Yeah. <laughs> I missed it so much. Well, it's funny because everyone, <laughs> Well, it's funny because everyone's fighting it because they have the big crash pad also that you might be able to see in yeah. Anthony's background there. But we have like this yeah. uh, uh, one right foot, a foot and a half, whatever, crash pad. And everyone's fighting to get thrown on it. It's like, oh, it's my turn to get thrown at it. No, it was my turn to get thrown <laughs> on it because no one wants to slip and then just get hit. These, these blue mats right on hard concrete. It sucks. Like, oh, man. we can take it. When I, you, we can do it. <laughs> just not over and over again. When I got thrown on the concrete, I remember... Um, the my ankle hit the the floor uh uh-huh. that was still that was hurting for like a month like i mean i'm, <laughs> I'm lucky i'm not my bones are kind of strong so otherwise i think i i probably had a fracture or something but i'm good <laughs> yeah it's funny during the break a member of our dojo ruslan did a judo demonstration video for his job as like a mm-hmm. they did a holiday talent show thing <laughs> so he made a video and yeah. he showed his talent when we're doing the video, there was twice. One time he literally did throw me, so my ankles hit the concrete oh off gosh. the mat. And then another time he tried, he was doing like a tomonage and almost threw me off the mat. And I was like, nope, so I spun oh. out of it. And I was like, uh-uh, sorry. <laughs> I'll take a throw. I'm just not being tomonage on the concrete, you know? <laughs> well, you, you guys edited that out, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's. I think we put it up on our you should Facebook make Instagram. a bloopers reel. <laughs> Blooper reel. <laughs> he has the hard. Yeah. He has the hard footage. He has the raw footage, so I don't have it. But you could do a blooper reel. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> so, as we're talking about this, we reopened our dojo, and for the first time ever, really, we decided to separate our classes. So we have an intermediate advanced class that for us is going to be green belts and above our orange belts are going to be able to go to both classes. And then from orange belt and below yellow and white, we're doing straight beginners classes. And this is the first time we've ever done that before. Usually we just lump us all together and we'll take like the brand new people and put them to the side with somebody and they'll work on their falls and the first few throws. But because we had so much interest of people wanting to join judo, they wanted to come to the dojo that we're like, okay, we don't, we don't want to have like 50 people on the mat. We could do it, but it's going to be a little crowded, mm-hmm. especially right now with social distancing still and people wearing masks. It's just going to be very tough getting everyone on the mat at the same time. So what we did- yeah, if we combined our, if we combine our beginners and advanced class right now, the numbers, I think we would have like 20 to 30 people on the mat oh, I th- at the minimum every I th- time. I think we would have almost 40 yeah. people because the, was it yep. Wednesday seemed to be our big day for our advanced class. And we have like about 20 people on that day. And then like this weekend we had close to 20 people again, we had 15. So yeah, it's close to 40, mm-hmm. but 
Yeah, so we had a lot of people want to join. Shameless plug for our wait, <laughs> shameless plug. plug for our dojo. <laughs> we we have the reason why I drive an hour. I was telling someone the other day. The reason why I drive an hour to our dojo is because we have like one of the most adults in the area, and um, yeah. So if you want training partners that are adult size and not like teenagers, then our dojo is a great place to go to. Yeah, our adult class, Continue. our advanced class is a real adults class. And even our our new beginners class has a, I think it has almost 50-50, has a good amount of adults, a good amount of kids in there. Like we had 15 yesterday and I said like, yeah, it was about 50-50. So for the first time ever, we've had these two separate classes. And what we're doing is that we want to really get people to learn the basis of judo. So when I teach class, and I teach class on Saturdays at Hollywood Judo Dojo on the weekends. Uh, on Tuesdays, we have the other beginners class and that's taught by Sensei Eric. But when I do it, what I like to do is I really like doing a lot of falling. You got to learn how to do back ukemi, for, for, uh, forward uh, rolling ukemi. I haven't done a forward flat one just yet, but we might get to that later and learn a side ukemi. Because what happens in my opinion is that people kind of learn how to fall forward, kind of learn how to fall sideways, learn forward ukemi rolling. And then after two weeks, oh, put them inside the adult class. And it's like, no, they need to actually learn how to fall because if you don't know how to fall, you're going to hurt yourself. And I know a lot of people are like, but I want to get to the throwing. I want to get to the throwing. It's like, I'm sorry. You have to learn how to crawl before you can walk. And you learn how to walk before you get thrown the shit out of you. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, uh, what, do you, also, what do you think about that? Yeah. So talk, talking about falling, you're right. Like a lot of places it's like, okay, you can do the movements now. Now go, in the, go join the rest of the people doing the regular stuff. And um the falling ukemi break falling is actually a lot more than that like some people are like why does my neck hurt why does this hurt or like i broke i slapped the mat why am i why do my knees still hurt right it's because people mm -hmm. for one tuck their knees in i still see it sometimes in beginners class and we call it out all the time right um yeah and also there's like the met there's a mental aspect of uh break falling um one thing that a lot of people don't mention is that you should breathe out when you take a fall. You shouldn't hold your breath, right? Because when you hold mm -hmm. your breath, you stiffen up and you feel the impact more. And that's something that we don't really tell beginners at first um, because they're like so focused on getting all their hands and feet and slapping the mat movements right, right? So mm -hmm. just telling them to remember to breathe out too is something really hard. To, to remember. So that's not as important when they're getting the, the first things down. Um, mm -hmm. Also to keep your mouth closed because impacts, you can bite <laughs> your own tongue. I've, I've done that before. I yeah, actually bit my own tongue the other day. <laughs> you just snap your jaw real quick. You're like, mm, oh, oh, oh man, yeah. my molars. Oh shit. <laughs> yeah. So breathing out um, is important. Also relaxation, like being confident in your break fall is a very mental uh, thing, right? If you're not confident and you're bracing for impact, you're going to tighten up. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, relaxing doesn't mean you go limp, mm -hmm. right? If you go limp, that's not going to be a good break fall too, which is why break falling is something that should be continually practiced beyond the beginner level, um, which a lot of people seem to ignore. Mm -hmm. But um, these things should be instilled into beginners after they get the basic movements down. Yeah. But that's my, uh, my thought. And we, we have seen a pretty good retention rate, right? So far. Um, yeah. We have nobody dropped out as far as I know. Uh, some people who haven't been coming that I know they're like, Oh, it's cause of work. I'll be, I'll be back. Mm -hmm. Right. But so far we haven't seen anyone drop out. So that's, that's good. Like the, uh, this little experiment so far is going pretty good. Mm -hmm. Well, the way, um, so let's go back to falling stuff. The way I like to teach my class, the way I structure it is that I like to do the warm ups and break falling. And that's usually about the first half hour class. I only teach an hour and a half class. So I do the first half hour mm -hmm. of warm ups and break falling. And then my sec, and then my second half hour is going to be throwing. And I like to do like a warm up throw and maybe go through one throw also. And my warm up throw is like the, always the basic judo warm up throw, especially for beginners, is also Fagati. I think it's a really good warm up throw because you get your whole body moving into it. It's easy. It's not complicated. And then I go into something more, not more difficult, but something more advanced. And like what we did yesterday, I went in with um, Ogoshi. Mm -hmm. And the reason I would do start with Ogoshi is because Ogoshi is a good base to go up to all the different throws. It's the same footwork for almost like 90% of our throws. It's the same footwork. Mm -hmm. 
turning your back, grabbing a person. Because you can go from Ogoshi into Ippon Sonagi. You can go from Ippon Sonagi into Moroto Sonagi. Then from Moroto Sonagi, you can go for Harai Goshi and then Uchimata and Hanagoshi. It just, it builds into each other, in my opinion. In the last half hour of class that I teach, I go into a pin. Because um, the reason I go into a pin is because the way I teach, I like to connect with what's happening. So if you throw for Ogoshi, it's not throw for Ogoshi. And I always make the joke about this. Look the ref or like, was that equal and was it not? I like to teach throw directly into Newaza. And when you throw to Ogoshi, you can go directly into Kesakatame. So that's what we went over. Yeah. And so in the first pins that I teach, it's Kesakatame because it's easy right there. The next one I might teach probably Yokoshi Okatame because that'd be the next easiest one to get into. Mm-hmm. And then later, once they learn all the pins, I'll teach what I call the circle of pins, where you go through all the pins <laughs> in a circle back and forth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But that's yeah, what so I like I, to do. I really, and, I really liked uh, you teaching Ogoshi as the first throw because mm-hmm. a lot of people, when they teach the the surikomi, I call it the surikomi action, which is like the suri tape, mm-hmm. the lapel hand pulling up and the sleeve hand yeah. pulling. A lot of people can't, beginners can't do that with both hands and also work, do the correct footwork. So Goshi mm-hmm. kind of just isolates it to just one hand because the other hand is just wrapping, right? And whether they're wrapping mm-hmm. it correctly or not is a different discussion, but it, it's a lot easier for people to do than say like telling them to do Ippon Senage where they have to like, do two things with the hands while doing the footwork or more de Senage where they have to do two hand movements again. So Ogoshi is a good beginner throw. Plus the, um, the throw is rather more controlled and it's not as hard of mm-hmm. rough of a fall as uh, Osotogari. Mm-hmm. And personally, I'm not, I'm not a fan of Os- Osotogari as a, a first throw. Um, Mm. because the landing can be really rough. And that's actually how I got my first concussion as a white belt was. Uh, well, you didn't I'm tuck your chin because you didn't so. listen. That's why. You need to tuck your chin, Anthony. So me, <laughs> <laughs> no, I did tuck my chin in. That's, that's the thing. But I'm a big, tall guy, right? So I'm going to be automatically paired up with the other big, tall guys in the room. And there's this guy, I, I don't know if he's listening or whether he still does judo anymore, but there's a this big, like 300 pound guy that looks like he used to play football in my old dojo. Mm-hmm. His name was Brandon and he is strong as an ox. And yeah, it doesn't take, if you have, if you're that strong and mm-hmm. you can't control the power, even if you do also Gadi improperly, you're gonna, he, he basically just like knocked me into the floor and it doesn't matter how I tucked my chin and my neck muscles were just not developed at the time to, to take that kind of impact. Yeah. So my head like went back and I hit the, the, the mat. So, so there's instances like that. And also um, one time I taught a beginner and not 99% of the time, most beginners don't do Osoto Gaudi properly. You, you yeah. know, they do some sort of Osoto Otoshi yeah. kind of yeah. uh, th- throw, right? where the weight transfer doesn't go into the right leg. They don't do the the pull correctly. But that one time where they have the leg straight, mm-hmm. they utilize the hip power and they have the Kazushi right, the guy goes flying. Yeah. Like it doesn't take much. It's like 10% strength. The guy goes flying. The other beginner hasn't been practicing in Kemi long enough, mm-hmm. so their head hits the floor. Yeah. So I've seen that happen one time. It's rare, but it happens. So that's why I'm not a fan of uh, a Soto Gari. And uh, another thing, reason I don't like it is because when you teach that as the first throw, guess what they do when they when they start doing randori? You uh, just see like this Ogoshi? little <laughs> footsie. <laughs> this little uh, you see it in kids more often, right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. it happens in adults too. They have they do this like that's the only technique they know and it seems like it's easy to do. So they do this like little footsie thing where they just kind of like look down, uh <laughs> hips out, bent over and just trying to do a far reaching Sotogari that's never going to work for the most part, unless you're much stronger than your opponent. Mm-hmm. But that's the reason why uh, Sotogari is not exactly my favorite technique to teach first, but I mm-hmm. think it's good to teach it, to start instilling these concepts into them. And uh, mm-hmm. well, that was a long explanation, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. Cause I, I know we've talked about this before. You don't like Sotogari because of that, those reasons. I like it because it's a good full body motion. I guess people used to doing um, 
uh, like I call like the bird motion and stuff, but the whole thing of like your leg comes up in the air, your head comes down, you get this full body motion. And again, that simulates for the advanced throws. It simulates Uchimata. It simulates uh, Haraya Goshi or Hanagoshi. So to me, it's like it opens up your hips and gets you used to this whole leg motion. And it's like, yeah, you do have to install it in people like lift the leg because they do a lot of times they'll do um, uh, kosoto will put the leg down and like just try to trip the person over. Mm-hmm. Or if you do karate there and you're striking, they'll they'll sweep, but they'll sweep and it going to like a forward karate stance almost. So their mm-hmm. toes are on the floor still. Yep. They're like, no, you got to bring that leg up. You got to get this motion because uh, trust me, this is going to help you later to swing your leg up. And Mm -hmm. it kind of goes back to being comfortable with your body motion goes back to Ukemi's again. And it's like why I do, um, when I teach people how to do Ukemi's and break falls, I do certain things that are a little bit uh, like, let's go to yesterday. So instead of just doing break falls, back break falls, just standing, squatting down and slapping the mat, I do the whole thing where you sit on somebody and then you fall backwards gives you a little bit of height a little bit of a little bit of distance that you're going to go down and it builds your confidence it's like it's not that bad it's like just keep people yeah. like, oh it's not that bad as i thought it was you put someone on all fours you send their back and you slide backwards back who came you slap you're like oh okay this ain't that bad this is only like two feet high so then when you get to three mm-hmm. feet four feet i don't know if you go as a giant you're going seven feet in the air or something you're going to be used to it and it's the same thing when you forward who came is when you do a forward who came over somebody so you don't just roll on the mat like how we start off i start off with people on their knees then kind of like from a squatting position and then we go into standing and some people just get that mental block of from squatting to standing it's just like i can't do that i'm just too scared so yeah you have to build their confidence that's why i have people do it over somebody and same with side break falls i do i do a the side break fall thing that a lot of people get scared about too do you hold on to somebody but just building that confidence and getting that muscle memory of getting used to it so when you do Osotogari, when you do get Osotogari, you get the muscle memory and not that much fear of going backwards <laughs> as much. Yeah. But like I said, like I always tell people, don't throw hard, try to throw as control, but hey, shit happens. And I'm not going to get mad at you. Shit happens. Yeah. Another another reason I don't like Osotogari is because the way it's taught, mm-hmm. I think it's important that it's taught that way because it teaches you the mechanic of the mm-hmm. throw, which is, is important. It doesn't matter what you do with your hands. There's many different hand movements to do it. But what's important is all the weight goes on to the leg that's being reaped, mm-hmm. right? So um, a reap, gari, uh, gari means reap, means you're reaping away something that's strongly connected to the ground. So that means all the weights on that mm-hmm. foot. So that's the, the most important part of that exercise. Um, but you never ever see anyone do a sotogadi that way in, <laughs> in, in a randori or in a fight, right? It's always some other sort of circular movement mm-hmm. or uh, entry from a different angle. It's always movements. So other throws. Yeah. Yeah, other throws like Ippon Seonage, like Ochigari, Koshigari, the way you t- you teach beginners, that can actually be used. Mm-hmm. Like you actually, I do that all the time. I still use most of my tournament wins are actually from the Osotogari, uh, not Osotogari, uh, o- Ochigari from um, to the basic movement that we do, mm-hmm. that we teach beginners. That wins me tournaments all the time. Partially has to do with my long ass freaking legs, right? But, <laughs> um, but those those throws you can use like right away, I think, and the impact is also uh, less. Mm-hmm. But um, going back to what you said about confidence, I think that's another thing that's really missed on a lot of beginners class. Like mm-hmm. I've started judo as a kid. I've started judo. Um, I've trained in multiple different places, and they all just to tell you like, what's the, why is, why is break fall important? Right. Why is being mm-hmm. uh, break falling important? And it's like, Oh, so you don't get hurt, but they don't, they don't really talk about how, if you're afraid of falling, then it means you're afraid of getting countered or afraid of attacking. Cause when 99% of the time as a beginner, when you do a really bad entry in your throw, you're going to get countered. Mm-hmm. Does that mean, so most people are going to not attack because you're like, Oh, if I do this, I can get thrown. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a, I think it's about the, what I say about confidence that it builds confidence that you know that you can fall and not get hurt. Yes. But the problem is that if you're still scared about getting hurt, like you've only done two mm-hmm. weeks of judo and then you get tossed into regular advanced class and you go yep. get someone strong, what are you going to do? You're going to stiffen up. You're going to stiffen up and not want to yep. be thrown. I, I, I can't be thrown. And you dealt with that guys with guys that literally yep. have said that I'm not going to be thrown. You're not going to throw me. 
then why are you here, man? <laughs> I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Why are you here? I, I've seen ladies say that before. I've seen men say that before. It's like, I'm not going to be thrown. Then why are you here? We're judo. We are a throwing art. I know we're cheap. I know it's why a lot of people come to us because we're cheaper than BJJ. I know we're cheap and stuff. But if all you want to do is Nawaza stuff, go to BJJ school, okay? We are judo. Yep. We start standing. We finish on the ground sometimes, but we start standing. Yep. Just just how it is. So, yeah. Yeah, that's the worst thing. I just feel like it's scary. That's why you, yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah, I feel like it's just more important to elaborate how break falls is more than just not getting hurt, but it's also to make mm-hmm. you, like you said, confident about fa- your falling. So you're not afraid to attack. You're not afraid to commit to your attacks. You're, you're gonna, mm-hmm. your, your attacks are gonna become better when your break falls become better. So mm-hmm. that's some a disconnect that I think a lot of teachers out there don't tell their students. It's like, if you're afraid of attacking because you're afraid of getting counter, you're afraid of falling, then your judo is not going to be as good. So, yeah, you just become a counter judo fighter, and all you can do is wait on people and end up getting shitoed, and you'd be like, turn and be like, well, what did I get shitoed out for? Right, the DQ. Well, because you didn't attack. That's just how it is, and that's why us starting this beginners class, and we're like you said, we're in the few dojos that actually are offering a beginners class because we're trying this experiment. You know, we want to try to keep people, bring people into judo with this beginners class and hopefully they evolve, get higher ranks and stuff and can go to the advanced class. And we get, we hope that they stay, they continue in judo and not just being scared of a two week intermediate white belt beginner class. And then, okay, get tossed to the wolves. And then that's one of the worst things also is when you get people that really, really, really want to do the advanced class that have no experience before. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, well, I wrestled, I did BJJ. It's like, we're different. I'm sorry, we are a different sport. It's just how it is. I think if you're a wrestler, yep. it's easier to go into BJJ and judo. But if you're a BJJ guy, I think it's a little bit tougher because you're not used to being thrown. We're wrestlers. Like I grew up wrestling. I'm used to being double leg, takedown, head and arm mm-hmm. throwed all the time. It's not a big deal to me. Sambo guys also can yep. transfer into judo easily and stuff. But the toughest I've seen in my life, and I'm not going to, I'm not saying that it can't be done. Okay. I'm saying BJJ can come to judo all the time. It's just, if you have to understand, you're going to get thrown, you're going to fall. That's yeah. what happens. Yeah, it's like you said, wrestlers transition really well. And I also think most of the people in the advanced classes were most people that stuck to judo mm-hmm. um, and kept kept going until they went to the brown and black belts. They're just like, they're just used to taking the falls. They're just tough, yeah. right? I kind of just toughed it out because I, I was never taught ukemi. In my opinion, I was never taught ukemi properly. Okay. And I had to go um, fix it myself and ask other people. But we just kind of tough it out. But for those people that can't tough it out, then that's when they quit, mm-hmm. which is why having a f- fundamentals for recreational people on the importance of chemi and how far it can actually improve your judo is important. And it's kind of like a survivorship bias. It's like, Oh, all these other people are still doing judo and they're taking falls just fine. When in fact they're te- they tend to be more athletic and kind of tougher. So, mm. um, yeah, so that, that's uh, really important. Well, in your opinion right now, what do you think about the way that we're teaching ukemis in our beginners class? Because like you said, you felt that you're never taught right. How about the way we're teaching right now with our beginners class? Do you think we're doing a good job? Yeah. To, to, well, first of all, I didn't start judo at, at our current dojo. No, no, no. I, no, no, I no. started as a kid. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I started somewhere else and they, they taught me the beginners stuff like that, but there wasn't enough repetition, I think like people don't like slapping the mat like a hundred times mm-hmm. like that in Japan, yeah. that's what they do for warmups in beginners class. It's like you stretch, you do a little bit of jog and then you slap the mat a hundred times and yeah. you keep your neck up an entire time. And I was talking about a uh, neck strengthening exercise before, right? So mm-hmm. the fact that you're doing those mat slaps, you're also kind of doing an isometric hold of your neck muscle. So you're developing mm-hmm. that neck muscle. And people don't want to do that because it's boring, right? But I feel like that's a really yes. important part yes. is one, strengthening your neck muscle. Two, you're conditioning your body and your brain to do the slap instead of sticking your arm out. And case mm-hmm. in point, there was one of the beginners that did Muay Thai. I told you the story already. That did Muay Thai that came in and yes. he was just like not having it when I told him you need to slap them at 50 times. I, I didn't even say 100. I said just slap them at 50 times. Mm-hmm. He got bored, started yeah. ignoring me and was looking at the, the head instructor teaching throws. And then I was like, yeah. okay, we're going to practice break falls. First thing he did when he fell was stick his arm out. 
<laughs> like, mm-hmm. and then he was of like, course. oh, and he realized, he realized, he looked at me like, oh, oh shit. Like, I didn't even know, like, I, I tried not to do it, but I did it anyway. Like, yeah. so sometimes there are some boring stuff that you just have to do. And yeah, um, I, I like the way that we teach. I think it kind of keeps people engaged and uh, the way you taught it keeps them engaged. Plus it shows them the importance of ukemi, importance of ukemi. And a lot of places, like when I was a kid and I did ukemi, they didn't show me what kind of falls you can take with that. They just said, mm-hmm. it's to save you from getting hurt. And this is what you're going to do. And you're going to do it. You're not going to ask questions, mm-hmm. right? When we do it, we do these jumps and things and people are like, oh, so this is, I'm doing this boring stuff so that in, in a couple of years, I can do that, that you guys are doing right yeah. now. And then yeah. you can like, you, you threw me with a really hard also to Gotti to show them like what kind of breakfalls, why these breakfalls are important. And mm-hmm. I feel like people were take people who saw that, not including the guy that came late to class, that I was talking about people who mm-hmm. saw that were just taking the break falls really seriously, which is uh, yeah. really important. I think. I think it's another good thing. Like when you have to explain why you do everything. Cause if you just dictate to people do this, cause I said, so they're not, it's not going to sink into most people, especially nowadays. That's the old school way. It doesn't work yeah. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's like, that's the way I was taught, but I can't teach that way now. Cause <laughs> people don't do that. Don't do that. You have to explain to them why I step here, why I pull them over to get on one leg, why, when I sweep, they're going to land. How do they land? Which way is which way they're going to land best? Well, you're, it's a mix between back ukemi and side ukemi pretty much. And if you don't land right, you're going to hit your head. Like we talked about before. Same thing when I teach Ogoshi yeah. yesterday, when I teach Ogoshi, I, just, I say yesterday, this podcast will go out like in three days or something. <laughs> but, but so when we do Ogoshi, I say, okay, so look, I throw him Ogoshi. He lands cross from me. We're pretty much in a T formation right now. Okay. He did forward Ukemi going down, but he lands like sideways Ukemi, like side Ukemi. This is why he lands this way. I try to explain why we do this. And it can't just be, it's just the way it's been done. You do it because I say it is. And then you hurt yourself. You put your arm out. It's like, no, you have to slap the mat, slap the mat, slap the mat. And it's again, building that repetition becomes muscle memory and you're used to it. And I know, I know it can be boring for some people. That's why I try to make it fun with jumping over people, doing some fun things, but you have to get the basis down. And the worst is when you have someone like this Muay Thai guy that came in that all he wants to do is throw. And you get that. You All I want to do is throw. All I want to do is throw. And before, because I wasn't teaching it, but we had someone else teaching class. We've had guys that are like, okay, fine, then go, just go, just go. And we would have two classes, like, okay, so we're all in one class, fine. You don't want to do this, go to the regular class, just go over there, work with somebody. And then they get hurt, they get thrown hard. And then we get the bad reputation of, oh, Hollywood's a bunch of bullies. Oh, judo's so tough. All they do is beat you up. It's like, no, we try to protect you, but you are so stubborn that you don't want to learn. I know everybody's dealt with this. Probably everybody in a dojo out there that's done judo, that loves judo, has always had a person Mm -hmm. that comes in. It's like, well, I've done this, I've done that. And it's just ah, so annoying. Like a little side story right here. This week I had a person ask to join the dojo and they kept, and I kept telling them what to do, come to regular class. I'm like, oh, I can't make it to regular class. Well, I'm sorry. Right, well, come to the beginner's class. I can't make it. Well, I'm sorry. That's our schedule. And they kept mm-hmm. bringing things up to me. Like, well, I train with this guy. Well, then if you turn with that guy, he would give you a belt. I think by now, if you train with him for so long, he would have given you a belt by now, I think. And then he would bring up, oh, well, I trained with this person. That's the BCA guy. To, for clarification, you said he was a three-year white belt. That's what you said. Yes. He said he was a three-year white belt with a very good sensei in New York, uh, when, in the East Coast and stuff. And it's like, well, I think if you train with somebody, even off and on for three years, this is just my black belt opinion. I would have given you a yellow or orange or green or something by that point. There, if so even if someone comes part time, you're going to be like, hey, you've been here two years. Here's a yellow belt, man. OK, at least you come every part time. But when they start name dropping people and say, well, I never got belt rank. I don't believe that. And then when they say, oh, well, I train with this BJ guy. That's BJJ. This is I'm, I'm not I'm sorry, but I'm not going to be impressed by that unless he's a mm-hmm. BJJ judo guy. But if I look on his stuff and all I see is just BJJ qualifications and I know who he talked about is like he's a BJJ guy. He's an MMA guy, but he's a BJJ guy. He's not a judo guy. Mm-hmm. And then he, they tried to name drop all the other names. Like, I'm sorry. It's just, this is how we're doing things. I'm trying to protect you. I know you don't want it, but I'm trying to protect you the best I can. I don't want you to get hurt. I don't want us to get a bad reputation about being bullies and beat up again. 
beating people up because we've had that said before about us. And no, mm-hmm. I'm just trying to protect you as best as I can. And please understand. Yep. That's some, my little rant we right do there. Get people like that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. So one, one other thing I think that a lot of places don't uh, go in depth enough with beginners is the importance of being a good uke, like a good partner, mm-hmm. like a good training partner. Mm-hmm. A lot of times they're like, especially I've, I've seen, I've went to other dojos where I get to spec, watch the, the kids class or a teenager's class. And they're always yelling at the kids, be a good partner, take the fall. And it's like, <laughs> Mm-hmm. Why? Like, why? you're always like <laughs> thinking, why? Like, I'm not uh, going to take the fall in a tournament, right? So it's like, what, yeah. why am I taking a fall? Like, how how do you be a good uke, right? You tell them to just mm-hmm. relax, right? Then they go limp as a noodle. Like, why? Yeah. Look at what is like too stiff and what is too loose, right? Yeah. And also, it's, it's a- <laughs> how? Yeah. Go ahead. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's always a weird thing. It's always like they're, they're too loosey goosey. They're a limp noodle or they're stiff yeah. as a board and you can't do anything. No, you gotta, you gotta feel this firmness yeah. in between there. It's, it's always hard to explain to somebody how to yeah. do that at first. Yeah. And a lot of people kind of just zone out when it's not their turn. Mm-hmm. Like when they're, yeah. they're the uke, they mm-hmm. just kind of zone out and being a uke it's, is a skill in itself, right? Like I'm like 200 something pounds, but, I can train with any for the most part, unless it's a certain throw that they can't even reach the, my neck, like <laughs> push a or something. Uh-huh. Right? Um, for the most part, I can train with anyone any size because I'm pre- I, I'm not bragging, but I am a pretty good uke. I think. Oh, nice humble um, brag. They can throw me. I can control how much I feel, like how heavy I feel to someone. Mm-hmm. I think, and that's a skill in itself. And people were just saying relax, but there are other thing, bad habits that people do like, um, stepping to the side, for example, mm-hmm. when someone is doing Ipponse Anage, like some people do it on, uh, unconsciously mm-hmm. and they don't know it. Um, some people, uh, put their hips out unconsciously mm-hmm. to stop a throw. They don't know that. And another example would be when you're working combinations, uh, let's say Ochigari, like an inner, inner reap into another movement, like Ipponse Anage. Mm-hmm. Some people, when you do like a hundred reps of those, they start getting uh, the muscle memory. So they'll move their leg before the person even even starts. They, the they don't. They don't even start. Right? They don't do so the because, setup. They just automatically put their leg back as if they did the setup. Yeah. Yeah, it's like they're so used to the movement that they just start moving their leg mm-hmm. and before the 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 setup happens. And those are all skills that you uh i can go more in depth into this but those are all skills of being an uke that will affect the quality of your training and going back to mutual benefit for judo how does that benefit you being a good partner by you helping that person get better he's going to become a better training partner for you in the future Mm -hmm. for you to try your techniques out and sometimes some that person might be trying something that you're like, oh, that looks pretty cool. Maybe I'll try it myself, right? Mm-hmm. And maybe it becomes your favorite technique. So that, being a good partner is way more than just being relaxed. And there's so many nuances to it that I think um, we need to instill in beginners really early on in the process. Because like I said, most people just mm-hmm. think like, oh, it's not my turn. Time to relax, chill out, think about <laughs> what I'm going to do after class. Like I'm going to go grab dinner with my girlfriend and it's like oh you're done okay now my turn right so yeah we, we have to like instill that into to beginners the importance of being a good uke yeah well the first thing i try to do when we do stuff like that and i forgot like it's coming back to the joe coming back to doing judo again it's like okay what is my what do i teach like how's my what do i like to teach and what do i how do i get to teach people i'm trying to remember it all over again yeah. And one thing I like to do with beginners to get them um, to get them engaged when their partner is working out is I always tell them count for your partner because you're focused on something. Your partner should be focusing on throwing you doing the Uchikomi. You should be focused on being a good partner by standing there for him, not too loose, not too stiff, not moving for him, but counting also. So when you come in, it's like one Two. So you're not just there, just, oh, what, whatever, uh-huh, what I have for lunch, what am I going to do next? Oh, what, what was that TV show I wanted to watch? Oh, what happened last night? You're focused on actually doing something. I think counting in a weird little way, I've, I've noticed that it keeps people engaged with the person because they see them moving each time. One, two, three. That's, that's one little thing I do. 
but mm -hmm. we do lose it as we get higher in belt ranks because there'll be other black belts I work out with and like we rarely count for each other but it's also because we're kind of critiquing each other also it's like hey Juan how'd that feel oh, I felt a little loose on this side the arms felt good but the legs were bad and I think something as you get higher ranks you start helping each other out that way and so when I see that with lower ranks taking the technique yeah. you can feel it mm -hmm. Yeah. But then when you get lower ranks and you see white balls be like, hmm, I think she's that's like, no, shut your mouth and just count. Okay. Let me tell them what to do. <laughs> because I mean, yeah, they that's, um, bad habits. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's something I realized since uh, we started teaching people and helping you out with uh -huh. beginners class is sometimes showing them is not enough. Like showing them, they have to feel it. You have to do it to them. So they mm -hmm. feel like this is what you were doing wrong. And then they're like, Oh yeah. Okay, I feel it now. That's that's the difference. Um, yeah, it's kind of something. That yeah, you should I absolutely find, agree with what you're saying. Yeah, uh, and it's when you come to like that demonstration, it's like it feels sometimes, especially when doing like beginners, they're like also to guide or even so nagers. They need to feel it. It's almost like you should, as an as like a black belt or something. It's almost like I feel something. I have to throw everybody so they get the feeling. Like, oh, is that what it feels like? Especially when you do into Nawaza things like Kesika Tame. Mm -hmm. I can explain because I'm until I'm blue in the face of how I like to grab at the bicep, pull it over, get underneath the head. And I'll tell people to do it. And they'll be like, do, do you feel any pressure on you? And be like, no, I don't feel any pressure. Like, okay, you need to feel pressure. And then I'll do it to them. Be like, okay. Do you feel pressure here? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now do that to them. Simulate that to them. Yep. And just one of those things of how you have to teach a judo sometimes. Yeah. You get your hands dirty. I wonder what, whether there's, I wonder whether whether there's a better way of teaching the Nawaza techniques mm -hmm. like that because we're throwing techniques. You can easily just say, "All right, everyone, line up, pull out the crash mat, and you just throw them." Yeah. <laughs> throw everyone. This is how it's supposed this to be. Like. Feels yeah. like get da, get da, <laughs> get da. <laughs> Each knee, sign. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of harder with Nawaza. Yeah, huh? it's so. tough because you got to get down on the mat with everybody. Unless I lay, unless I sit down, I'm like okay, next come down, next come down, next come down. <laughs> A conveyor belt of just yeah, crash down. mat. <laughs> crash mat. There's a there's some debates online about the functionality of crash mats. A lot of people hate it mm -hmm. because they're you know like it's kind of blocking your, yeah, your entry it, into the throw. So you're going to it's kind of weird. I but get it. I I still think for beginners, there's a lot of uh, benefits to it. Mm -hmm. Oh, especially um, for beginners. Yeah. One thing I think we should do this this crash mat over here that the black one that I'm pointing <laughs> to that we have. I think it's too high. Like. The one in my garage kind of folds into a, a lower one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not as cushiony, but um, I think it's a little <laughs> better for techniques like Osotogadi and mm -hmm. stuff. But well, I can just tell you, like, just yeah. straight off the bat, one of the one of the bad things about crash pads is that yeah, you do feel a stiffen because you can't move as much. You can't get as much leg movement turn around mm -hmm. on somebody. But one of the good thing about crash mat, this is like for beginners and adults, is that say a beginner throws really hard, it's oh, it's Okay, because you're on a crash mat. You're not going to hurt yourself that much. You'll be fine for the most part. Okay, it's kind of hard to hurt yourself on a crash mat. Then you get to the advanced class. And it's like, I can throw the, just go hard, just all the way out, throwing throwing you as if I was throwing a tournament and I don't have to worry about not hurting you. So those are the, thing, those are the two big reasons for crash mats for one for the beginners, one for the adults that when you get the adults, I throw as hard as I want to a tournament style and I know what it feels like. For the beginners, they throw, they're not going to hurt each other. They're not going to get hurt. It'll be fine. So let, but let yeah, I know what you mean about something. Okay. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Uh, fin fin finish up. Finish up what you're going to say. No, no I'm just saying it's, I know our crash pad, we kind of got to do, like I said, it's mm -hmm. about a foot, maybe foot and a half. It's, it's a very mm -hmm. thick crash mat we have. We wanted to get a thinner one that I saw at another dojo, but we just couldn't find it. So I had to go to here in Los Angeles, Pro Box in a studio city. Fuji mat. <laughs> and we got a crash mat. Yeah, but it was going to take too long to get it. I got this one like in a week. Uh -huh. So... Well, I can't I bring the one in my garage. This one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So go ahead. What's yeah, your so question? I was going to say, like, what do you think? I, I noticed like in our beginners class, some of these guys were pretty big and strong and they're going to mm -hmm. do the Ushikomi's like super fast and super hard. And I, I told them like, Hey, you need to like slow down, like slow it down mm -hmm. because when they're doing it fast and strong and they're pulling the person mm -hmm. off balance, I'm like, you think you're doing it right, but you're actually not. <laughs> you're, mm -hmm. ma you're making up for your bad technique with strength and speed. And mm -hmm. it seems like they kind of get it, but then they go back to doing the boom, yeah. boom, boom, like explosive <laughs> movements. Yeah. And I'm like, this guy is like 100, because he was paired up with Matthew, like uh, little Matthew. Oh, okay. And okay. I'm like, 
yeah, this, this guy is like a hundred pounds lighter than you. And <laughs> if you need that much strength to move him, then uh-huh. what's going to happen when you fight someone your, your size, right? Well, so Matthew has a very low center of gravity. So now I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So do you, do you think it's good to tell these like people who are strong and naturally athletic to just like slow down and focus on a technique and use less strength? Cause maximum efficiency, mm-hmm. right? Why are you using, I mean, there, there are places in time where you want to do those fast, str- strong, which you me for different purposes, like warm ups and training explosive entries. But, um, for a beginner, I, I think they should slow it down and focus on whether their hands are in the right position, whether like their footwork is right and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Now I get what you're saying right there. Cause a lot of people like they're trying to overcompensate with what I do have. I don't have this technique. I don't know how to place my foot, right. My hips not going over, but at least if I do it fast and strong with my arms doing the, what I call the butterfly curls. And we put your wings up in the air. Mm-hmm. It's like, if I do that fast and strong, I can pull them that way. When I see that, and like I like you already said, you gotta tell people. It's just you gotta tell people over and over again. It's like the cat thing. A cat does something, you squirt it with a water gun, it learns not to do that. Mm-hmm. And just like a person, you gotta keep telling them, calm down, go slower, calm down, go. And they might hate it, but they're gonna learn it after a while. And if you keep going to the same person, dude, I said to calm down, miss, please stop. Like you guys need to slow down. And I'll stop the entire class. I'll be like, clap my hand, mate, everybody circle up. Okay. Go through the, go through it slow. I want everybody to go through one, two, three. All right. Not three. I want you to go one, two, three step side turn step side. And I'll tell them that to try to get them to slow down, to try to get them to um, get the, not the pattern of um, I always, there's also a pattern that I like to do. And it's like when you step, it should be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Mm-hmm. But that's when you go fast. When you go slow, it should be one, two, three, four. So it's just, you got to just get into their heads. You got to give them little things to think about as they're doing Uchikomis that, okay. And I know some people hate, oh, one comes up with dumb stuff. One comes up with dumb little riddles or rhymes to get people that, but trust me, this shit works. You think about this when you do it and it makes more sense to you. Like the whole way I always tell people to go into the judo two step. When I say to people like, what's a judo two step? I step in sideways, ball the foot and turn. I do two steps and turn, judo two step, one, two, turn. And when they say that and they go through it like, oh, okay, this makes sense. Instead of people saying, okay, step in here and then just turn. Or there's also a triangle, little things to get people to think about. You need to make a triangle with your toes. The bigger the triangle, the more pull. The smaller the triangle, the less pull. Just little things you got people to think about and tell them to slow it down and think about it. And just this guy keeps just saying that slow it down. I think it's Calm also down. about control Not too, experiment. like being uh-huh. able to control your strength. Like if you if you only have mm-hmm. zero and a hundred, and you can't do fifty <laughs> or thirty, then then that that's something uh-huh. you should probably control, right? Again, if it, mm-hmm. it wasn't Uchikomi training, if Matthew was sparring this hundred pound heavier guy and he's going like a hundred, mm-hmm. like bad things will happen, right? So yeah, well, it's like, them con- it's only like control oh. the strength is a good idea. Yeah, it was the whole thing like, well, let's, let's, like, it's the whole joke. Hey, let's go light. Hey, you want to roll light, and then next thing you know, you're both bleeding full of blood on the mat. You know, it's like, no, okay, that to just me. because <laughs> someone has to be the, uh, someone has to be the adult. The sensei in charge should be the adult and should be watching all this shit happening and go down. Because mm-hmm. I've seen it many times happen where guys would do something accidentally. I've, like, years ago, like, I had to be eight, maybe nine years ago or something, two guys almost started slugging it out. Mm-hmm. And Philippe was like, what are you two idiots doing? You go over there. You go over there. And it's like, it was just because of a little accident. One goes hard. Then next person goes harder. Then next person goes hard. And the next thing you're just going full blast at each other at practice. It's practice, people. Practice. You're not at nationals. And like I always said, you're not getting paid for this. All right? You're not getting paid. I don't know if we told the story about your uh, wrestling friend, your BJJ school, but you want to know what? <laughs> Tap out. You're not getting paid for this. Technically, yep. You're paying for this technically. All right. You're the one paying for <laughs> <Yes>. this. <laughs> yep. But yeah. Guys, just so slow I know down. we didn't plan. Yeah. Yeah. No guy. Yeah. I didn't, we didn't plan to talk about this, but because you talked about the go light kind of meme, um, mm-hmm. I want kind of want to ask <laughs> your opinion on this. Like, I, there, in judo class, there was a guy who was like, oh, I like going with you. You're so technical and you go light and you just like flow with it. Mm-hmm. And then meanwhile, he's like elbowing me in the face <laughs> and cross-facing me and stuff uh, like that. At judo? So, huh, at judo, yeah. Okay. <laughs> was it? An, 
Yeah, and then there's not not this guy, but another guy, some other guy that likes to grab my fingers uh, and stuff uh, like that. I'm just like, dude, like, <laughs> but anyway, my, my point is in the Waza training, um, what do you think about people who, cause we, people don't teach people how to do Nawaza randori, mm -hmm. like the, the training. When I went to watch practice in Japan, mm -hmm. they mostly do Nawaza randori as a warm up, which we do here too, yeah. right? But um, they usually have one guy uh, turtle up or go, on, go flat on stomach. Mm -hmm. And the other person would basically practice turning them over uh, for like a minute straight okay. or two minutes straight, mm -hmm. right? And then you swap roles, right? That's their Nawaza Randori. Mm -hmm. But here, I notice whenever people do it in a lot of different schools, they'll do knee wrestling, mm -hmm. which is like something that never ever happens in judo <laughs> in competition. So I don't know why they practice it. Mm -hmm. And or um, they'll go in the stomach and they go like super tight. Like they, they tighten up and guard yeah. their neck and they just like turtle there. And it's like, okay, if this happened in a tournament, I wouldn't even waste strength trying yeah. to pry it, everything yeah. open. I was just like, wait for you to stand back up. So why do you think places don't say like, Hey, when you turtle up, you should only go like 50% ish or something and leave some openings. Cause during a transition from a throw, which is, I like, again, I liked that you teach transitions from throw mm -hmm. during transition from throws. That's when the openings are, but once people get to the floor and they tighten up, it's already kind of too late to like try and get yeah. them to turn over. Well, especially in judo, I just stand back up. There's competition yeah. and you turtle up. I don't have to engage in a with you. I know a lot of BJJ guys will get mad about that. But like, Hey bro, let's go. Let's the ground. It's like, eh, I'm judo. We're in a judo dojo. We're not in a BJJ school. I can stand up anytime I want to. I can disengage, stand up and be like, all right, stand them back up anytime I want. But it gets to the mentality of a lot of people that what they call uh, gym warriors or dojo warriors, mm -hmm. that they don't compete and their competition that they can't lose. They don't want to give anything up is at the dojo. And then there's, there's always going to be certain people like, I don't want to lose that guy. I don't want that guy to get one up on me. So you're going to get that sometimes. I understand that. But again, it goes back to its practice. It is judo is supposed to be mutual benefit. It was, um, as for instance, like last week, one of our higher members, of, uh, one of my best partners, actually, Charles, we were going at it during, during a waza. He got me in Sankaku and stuff. I tried to get out of it. Uh, he had it nice and tight. Like, I don't find a hundred percent. He's not going a hundred percent, but I'm letting him work. And at the end, he's like, Oh, thanks Juan. Don't thank you. Do not slam me. Give me a dog. Out. I was like, why am I going to slam you at practice? Like, I like you. We're practicing I, right here. It makes me okay. question like, where he's I, training, I could, you know? <laughs> like, Well, I know he, we know a jujitsu place he trains at also and stuff. So, yeah. but the thing is like, when you come back to judo, there's that, it's supposed to be mutual benefit, mutual respect. And I know because I train sometimes at BGJ places and even my catch wrestling places, there's guys that are just like, I'm not losing to nobody. I'm not giving up anything. And it's like, it's practice. And I know it's hard for a lot of people to understand because they're gym warriors or dojo warriors, but it's practice. And again, it comes down to the sensei or the one teaching, instructing, whatever, to see this happening and tell people, calm down stop switch and there's there was a brown belt member of our dojo that likes to do that to white belts all the time there uh, we'll Got have a brand new white belt come in and stuff <laughs> yeah yeah we'll get there'll be a brand new white belt that would come in do his two weeks or three weeks of side little white belt training did me red class like oh 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 i'll go with him i'll go with him. and then i next time i see him he's doing arm bars to white belts and i tell him like no what don't you understand I know people hate it because Juan's a stickler for rules, but you're not supposed to arm bar a white belt. And don't give me that shit of, oh, well, he said he did BJJ. What belt rank is he in BJJ? Uh, I think he's a white belt in BJJ. He's a white belt in BJJ. <laughs> <laughs> so well, they do teach gets, white belts arm bars, but that's not that's not the the point though. But yeah, yeah. The the point is that when you're doing Rondori and stuff, especially Nate Wazon Rondori, it's supposed to be mutual benefit. They get to practice, you get to practice, and yeah, the sensei. And it gets tough for the sensei too about telling someone, calm down, stop. Cause it's like, I feel like a broken record sometimes, especially when I'm telling the same people over and over and over. It's like that. I said, it's a cat thing. I got a water gun. There's that cat. Stop. Stop. <laughs> yeah. I just get really annoyed when they tighten up all the way. Cause I'm like, I'm not going to spend like three minutes trying to yeah. pry your, your tight guard yeah. open. It's kind of stupid. It's to the point where I would like do some really crazy commitment to try and turn mm -hmm. them over and they'll just go on top of me and I'll let yeah. them pin me just so I can practice escapes. Yeah. Cause I don't want to spend four minutes trying to get them to loosen their guard when 
it's more beneficial for me to practice my escapes from their mm. pins. So that's what I like doing. That's my way around it without being confrontational. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's our takes on like beginner in class and stuff, guys, be cool. Mm -hmm. Try to take in everything. The sensei is trying to teach you. They're not, sensei is not trying to hold you back. The sensei is trying to help you as much as they can. And that leads us into like our next topic. If you don't mind talking about it, Anthony, because you brought this up, yeah. you brought this to my attention. You no, know, was it yesterday? Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I really like reading uh, research and discussions on how to teach like ways, different ways of teaching. Mm -hmm. um, not cause I like to teach, but more cause I like, to learn like i want to improve my personal ways of learning right i want to question like why are things being taught this way is there a better smarter way of teaching because mm -hmm. i started judo uh pretty well i started as a kid but i quit but relatively late i didn't do it my whole life and i t t in my mind i only have like this amount of time left of my athleticism before I'd like wheelchair bound or too old to, to do certain things. So I want to utilize train, train smarter, not harder, mm -hmm. basically is what I want to do. And when you're young and fit, like training harder might give you better results faster, but I can't do that anymore. I can't compete with the younger people, mm -hmm. even though I look pretty young, but I'm not that young. <laughs> so, um, i came across this thread on the BJJ subreddit mm -hmm. where this guy, I, I sent this to you already and I could probably post it in the, the description afterwards. It's the title is feeling really discouraged about my progress lately. And I'm convinced that 90% of BJJ, uh, how do you pronounce this word? Um, pedagogy. Yeah. 90% of BD, BJJ pedagogy is teaching moves in the context. That's mostly useless. So there's a pretty long rant, I guess, but, um, mm -hmm. Uh, just I'll just try and read the the key parts. Okay. Everything is like here's a back take from uh, Reverse Dela Hiva, which I can never fucking use because I drilled it on a cooperating <laughs> opponent, and more importantly, have never actually been taught to play Reverse Dela Hiva. I've been trying mm -hmm. to learn and apply some open guard stuff in sparring, but everyone acts like it's the Olympics, and I get passed immediately <laughs> because nobody taught me any details about playing the position. So I just revert to wrestling and scrambling like a, uh, I'm not going to use this word, um, <laughs> oh, or even okay. close guard. I know more techniques from there than any other guard, but most of it I've never used because I've only used close guard when drilling with 0% resistance and when in a fucking Thunderdome fight to the death in sparring. So I love that Thunderdome bit. People, yeah. <laughs> Or for sim or for simpler examples, how about teaching and training fucking grip breaks? So this is something you learned in judo. Funny enough, but uh. grip fighting escapes, even passing, stand up to precursors to being able to actually apply these hundreds of moves you're stuffing into my head. Why am I wasting time running laps and doing elementary school stretches? Why do we drill on people that behave like vegetables? Why do you show a move once every nine months and expect me to be able to use it? See, I kind of relate to that part. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of BJJ schools I've been to, I learned like one move like for a week and then we never do it again. And I can never mm -hmm. ever apply it in uh, sparring. So why don't we do positional sparring? So that's actually a lot of schools do that now. They, they see a lot of value in that. So they start doing it. Okay. But um, that's just a rant. And I feel like a lot of people in the comments actually resonate with that feeling. Mm -hmm. And there's some black belts in here that actually chimed in and talked about, yeah, it's totally BS. This is why I'm testing out teaching using these different methods. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a lot of different suggestions here. And um, I'm not going to go through every single one of them. But um, one thing I want to get your take on one, since you did wrestling mm -hmm. is, uh, let me read this comment about the wrestling one. Let's see. So someone asked... Um, Someone asked, okay, so how, how can I better structure my classes when I teach? And this guy said, go sit in on a successful high school wrestling program. Teach how the coaches teach. So <laughs> it's like you already have a successful model there. Why, do you, why are you doing this different thing? Why not just copy what's already working? So me being someone who grew up abroad and went to a school that had no wrestling program because it's a shitty district and no money. Um, <laughs> Yeah. 
can you can you explain to me what a high how how your coach taught you wrestling? Like, what is a program? What is the program like? How many times a week do you go practice? Oh wow! Okay, so just like any high school program, you go see. So wrestling was five days a week. So you go Monday through Sat Monday through Friday and stuff, and you would have dual meets on Thursdays during dual meet season. That's when you had the cross town rivalries where you go up against another high school and stuff. So you wouldn't wrestle that day really. And then you do tournaments every Saturday. So you'd be wrestling technically six days a week. Your only day off would be Sunday, unless it was a two day tournament. Mm -hmm. But you would go to judo, you'd go to judo, you'd go to wrestling practice. <laughs> Five days a week, it was a minimum of two hour classes, sometimes be less, uh, sometimes more, depending on like what time of the season it would be. But it was normally a two hour class, two hour class, two hour uh, practice. And what we would do is that we'd go for, um, so we'd go for a run, we either run around the high school or run around, some of you run around town sometimes to build up our cardio or because the rest are trying to lose weight, you have the plastics on. So we'd run, come back, do our elementary school warm ups. <laughs> we do elementary school warm ups. <laughs> Then we would work on, uh, let's see, double legs, single legs, uh, just work on that with a partner, left and right side, got to be ambidextrous. You don't know which side you're going to get. Of course, you're going to be good. You're going to be better on one side than the other. And that's something that I do think that wrestling and judo has um, have together is that they work on both sides. You know, judo, we work on both sides. Wrestling worked on both sides. Where when I go to like BJJ or even sometimes catch, we only do it on what your strong side is. They tell you to work on. They don't tell you to work on your weak side. So you do that, then you do partner drills of, uh, of, um, like, um, one minute rest, uh, like one minute wrestling, you know, just takedowns and you'd be like three man drills. Mm -hmm. So it's one man in one man out, one man in one man out the entire time doing takedowns. And then, then sometimes kind of like King of the Hill, though. Yeah, not King of the Hill because you're not doing like 10 guys or five guys and you have to continuously go okay. on those one minute out, uh, okay. one in one out, one in one out. So you're always wrestling. You'd only get like a one minute break or a two minute break sometimes. Okay. And got it. Again, it's just takedowns. You're just doing takedown, takedown, takedowns. And then you go into sometimes you go into like pins, you know, you hold the guy down and have to escape the pin or not, or not that you get into pins because you don't, in wrestling, if you get pinned, you're screwed. Okay. It's a one second pin in wrestling. All right. right. As soon as your shoulders touch the mat, boom, match is done. So you'd be in a referee's position. And again, they're trying to stand you up. You're trying to sit out. You're trying to do whatever you can to get, to get back up. The person on top of you is trying to take you down and take your back so that you go onto the mat, trying to get a half Nelson on you or a cradle or um, one I used to do when I was younger called the angel wings pins, which is kind of like a double. Mm -hmm. um, well, how would I compare it to? Um, kind of like a Kimura, I guess you would say. Basically, I have your... Mm -hmm. Elbows would be behind your back and both arms would be wrapped. And I took and I tilt you onto your um, back from there. Mm -hmm. So it's drills like that. And then the last 30 to 40 minutes of class would just be wrestling. You would have your dual meet. You would have your dual meet. You would have your like the varsity versus JV, frost soft versus JV, frost soft versus seniors. And you just go out there and just wrestle everybody. And we would do three minute matches because it would be whatever the regulation time was. I think it was three minutes back then. It could be longer, shorter. I don't know. I'm older now. <laughs> and you would just wrestle, 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 wrestle after that. But the thing is like, to me, that's not for, uh, that's how I grew up. That's how we did it. It's very similar to how Sensei Philippe teaches our class now. Like it's, it's not that much a big difference. Yeah, the, it, yeah. It's pretty much the same. So when I hear people, when I hear people say that. So how do they, depth yeah, go ahead. Do they not demonstrate techniques and like, let's say I've never wrestled before yeah. and I show up to class and they tell me to do like a, a, a pin, like I don't yeah. know any pins. So, so well, how are they going to teach that to me? In the beginning of the year, when you first start the wrestling season, you're going to get a bunch of new freshmen inside the class. You're going to get maybe some, uh, some sophomores, maybe a junior, sometimes a senior just wanted to wrestle his last year, wanted to try it out. Um, when I was younger, MMA was just becoming kind of popular. So guys would be like, yeah, I want to learn this, this wrestling from it. And that's actually funny because my wrestling coach used MMA videos as his demonstrational videos. Cause he would get his, he, would, he was able to go to every PE class for a week or one day and talk mm -hmm. to them about joining wrestling. And he would show UFC videos. He would, he would make this thing of Olympic wrestling and UFC videos. <laughs> that's how you get them excited. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To get people into it. But yeah, the first week you, you demonstrate this is a double leg. This is a single leg. This is a high C. This is a head and arm throw right here. This is a back take right here. This is um, a half Nelson. This is a cradle. And the reason I think that wrestling is so effective and why anyone can learn wrestling pretty fast is because just like I went through right there, those are the main moves in wrestling. 
Yes, there's different things like sit outs and turnovers, Grammy rolls, all these different fancy things. But in wrestling, if you got a good double leg, a good single leg, a good half Nelson, that's all you need. That's all I need is a good double single high C, a good half Nelson into a pin to hold a guy down. I'm, I'm golden. I'm good. I at least love doing uh, cradles on people. Because what I would do is that I would go for a single leg and I wouldn't finish it, but I would sit out, take the back, get on top of the guy, and I would go for my cradle from right there, from, my, from that position right there, and go for the pin. So wrestling is just, it's very straight. Like we talk about how judo was streamed down from what original Japanese jujitsu styles were. In judo, we have a base of 67 throws. All right. That's just 67 throws now, that I you think. should know. Six, okay, 68, 68 throws uh-huh. that every black belt should know how to do or should know the basis of how to do it if someone asks them about it. That's 60, that's 68 throws, not including all our pins, all our chokes, all our arm bars. There's not a whole variations. lot in there, but uh-huh. variations. That's where you get into it, variations. So we're, we're counting over at least over 100 techniques in judo, at least, mm-hmm. if not more. And then you get into BJJ, that has variations on top of variations because you got gi guys, no gi guys, guys that like wearing pants, but no top guys that like wearing pants, but we're like wearing shorts. You have all these different variations. So I would say in BJJ, you have even more variations. So it's tougher to learn all these things. But in wrestling, it's like five moves. You learn five good moves or just three good moves. You're golden. If I got a good double leg, and I can blast you down, get past your legs and a half Nelson. Shit, that's all I need. It's two moves right there. A good double leg where I pick you up, put you on your side. I'm already in what would consider Yoko Shokotami in judo, side control. Half Nelson, hold you there, hold your bicep over or under, either way. I got one second to hold you in high school wrestling. That's all I need is one second. Where in judo, we have- So you're saying when they- no, go- when they teach it to you, you basically they basically just show you and you just copy it. They don't like say step one this, step two this, step three this, or well they like they do just well, like anything how- else. Like okay guys, you set up you you're in collar and elbow tie up, you snap them down, they come up, you step in for a double leg, and it's it's not like it's not as broken down as judo where it's step one two three. It's like mm-hmm. you come here, you come there, you come inside right here, blah 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 da 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 da, pick the person up pick up your hips, swing them to the side and take them down. So they demonstrate that. And then they, you go work with your partner. Okay. Do they um, talk about stuff like Kazushi, like, or like <laughs> off balancing or like, uh, like, like, you know, like not, yeah, yeah. not just do this and then do this. There's not a lot of that in wrestling. The only thing that I could compare mm-hmm. to Kazushi, and this is from my wrestling background, okay? I wrestled in the Bay Area, everybody. Santa Clara, San Jose, all that area. That's where I wrestled at. I went to state and stuff. Um, I practiced there. But the most that we got through, like, with Kazushi and stuff, and this is, like, like I didn't get super high, okay? I wrestled in college a little bit, but I didn't get, like, super high to nationals and all these other fancy things. The closest thing that we got to, like, Kazushi, like, in judo is a snap down. I snap a person down, their natural reaction is going to maybe pop back up. That's when I shoot underneath, okay? I push the guy up. He's going to try to come back down onto me. Then I snap him down hard, put his face into the mat, and take his back. Like, that's, like, to me, the biggest thing in Kazushi. There, there was no push him back to pull him forward, like, in judo, or I'm going to pull him sideways. Well, there is because I do an arm drag. That would be a little bit of pulling him sideways. I'm using that momentum of him pulling mm-hmm. him. And if you don't know what an arm drag is, I know – um. Yeah, I think they call it sometimes an, a Russian arm bar or a Russian, not a Russian arm, a Russian arm something. Someone told me. I someone know what arm one time is, I but I've never hey. heard of that. <laughs> someone I catch asked one time, I was like, hey, Juan, do you know how to do a, a Russian arm pull or one arm Russian thing? And I was like, uh, what's that? And they showed it to me. And I was like, oh, you mean arm drag? <laughs> it's like, I don't know why they come up with these weird fancy names for stuff. Like this is what I always joke yep. about also is seatbelt. I get it. I understand where seatbelt comes from, but I grew up my entire life an over under. You get an over under from behind, that's a seatbelt grip. Over under from the front, that's a seatbelt grip. So when people say, hey, you get that seatbelt, I'm like an over under. I don't know why they come with these word names sometimes. Well, that it always clicks gets in me. like a seatbelt. I, I, it makes sense. <laughs> seatbelt, at least. No, I, I so, totally get it. I totally, and it, goes, and it goes to me like when I come up with like little dumb things to help people remember stuff. Like, yeah, it makes sense. A seatbelt. I get it. It's interesting to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so but yeah, we, we, we demonstrate also part. when we, 
Okay, you would go Sorry, second part. Finish. Fi- yeah, the, the, no, it's just, la- the when you start off, is a. Uh... Is it? It's getting bad again. Damn, my roommates are playing video games or something. <laughs> um, go ahead. Finish. When you start what off you the say? season, when you start off the season, the first two to three weeks, I think I say even the first two weeks, it's just demonstrating techniques certain techniques and i said okay it's like the first two weeks and after that you just get into normal things and then coach will show you like combinations of arm drag take the back do this or the double leg into a single leg or single in the double sit out take the back they'll start showing you a combination of that but again wrestling and i know some people might hate it's like it is literally like five moves and to be a really good wrestler Mm -hmm. you only need three but if you know five great moves and it's all you need that's all you need that's all you need that's all you need to know that's why wrestling so easy I love wrestling. I'm not saying wrestling's easy so to do. I love wrestling people. I have, <laughs> I have a lot to say uh, regarding, uh, not to disagree with you, but to expand on what you're going to say. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm going to finish reading the second part of that comment was saying, wrestling assumes each person has six brain cells, <laughs> which works really well because most of us have six brain cells. <laughs> Since everyone competes in wrestling and the coaches are held directly accountable for their performance and 85% of your students won't be prodigies. Winning programs win by making their 85% of untalented students competent, <laughs> not pretending not to see them and focusing on your 15% spatial geniuses. I think um, this is something that judo is actually really guilty of. Mm-hmm. I think if you, if you can even call it guilty is a lot of people look at success, um, how successful a sensei or instructor is mm-hmm. based off of the, like their best students, right? Yeah. Like, oh, this guy, this guy trained like 10 Olympians or two Olympians or whatever. And it's like, okay, what about the rest of their students? Right. Mm-hmm. It's like, does that make them a good instructor? Because they took someone else naturally talented and made them into like one of the highest level athletes. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, if your goal is to train Olympians, which for judo, it's like, for the most part, it's true. Then yeah, then that's great. That's what they should, maybe they should go be a national coach or something. Right. Mm-hmm. But if you're just like trying to be a good instructor at your local dojo, what's gonna, especially if you're a for-profit dojo, what's gonna make you a successful instructor, I think is helping people who aren't naturally gifted and succeed and learn mm-hmm. judo. And I mean, we, we can go into a different definitions of um, succeeding. It doesn't necessarily mean mm-hmm. winning medals or anything like that. But I think that's a really good point that's made here is that, depending on what your goal is, the teaching methods might be different. And wrestling is very competition based too. And um, yeah. now, now to expand on what you said, I, I talked about this briefly with you before we started recording was wrestling and also judo in like Japan and France, they're part of the school program. And like you said, you wrestle six days a week. So it's <laughs> yeah. teaching teaching when you can assume that every student shows up to every single class, your mm-hmm. curriculum is going to look different than a dojo where you hold classes three days a week and people might not show up due to girlfriend or work or whatever. And I think the curriculum has to change based off of that. So to respond to this guy's comment saying that you should just teach how wrestling teaches, I think it's not, it's kind of like, doesn't go over like the cons of that that system is that it doesn't work for everyone um yeah now do you, do you have something to add to that before i uh keep going uh, the one thing i have to add about that is yes as adults and even as youths when you put them in a judo class and st- and things like that in high school you have your school work to do your homework their personal life and things like that but it's easy to go to go to wrestling practice five days a week. I'm already at the school, you know, I'm hanging out afterwards. I'll be inside the wrestling room. Okay. I'll be on the mats inside there. And then I want to go depending on the person. Cause I had friends that wrestled with me that hated going to competitions. They were on the varsity squad, but they would hate going to weekend wrestling tournaments and they would just not go. But for someone like me, that was my, that was my life in high school. Like I loved wrestling. I would go to like every practice. I'd be at every dual meet. I would be at every wrestling tournament. And if it was a weekend trip tournament, I would always be telling my parents, yeah, I'm going to Chico for the weekend with the wrestling club. Like just let them know that we're doing this. But yeah, it's much easier when you're younger and it's part of the school system to go five days a week, do six days a week of wrestling for three to four months. 
It's easy. But as an adult, I get it. And if um, you can only go twice a week or three times a week, you have to understand you're going to forget stuff. Even at our dojo, at some points, like during the, <laughs> before the pandemic, we were practicing five days a week pretty much because mm -hmm. we would have three days a week normal class. And then we would do sometimes the uh, weekend randories on Saturdays. So that's already four. And then sometimes we, do, we would do fitness. That would just end up being, we would end up doing judo yeah. things anyways afterwards. So you can be working out at our dojo five days a week, no problem. But I understand as an adult, you have work, you have family, you have things. But that's the thing about grappling systems. And I get back to it again. Wrestling has like five main techniques. Judo itself, like I said, we went over, has over a hundred techniques that you need to learn. BJJ has probably even more than that. Where if I go into boxing, I got jab, cross, right hand, uppercut, shovel hook. And that's, that's like, it's again, like five, six moves. That's all I have to do with my hand techniques. If I do karate, front kick, right, uh, front kick, roundhouse, side kick, hook kick, um, question mark kick. Like there's, there's only so many things I can do with my hands and feet that make it easier to learn these things and easy to make combos from it. But grappling, there's just a thousand of things to do. And I understand the guy talking about earlier, it's like, oh, we do this one technique and then we don't do it for months. Well, the sensei wants to teach you everything. So I'm sorry if I can only go through a kimura from this position once every two, three months, or I can only go from a sankaku from the bottom again, once every two, three months. Cause one sankaku doesn't work that much in judo. It's not a big judo move. What works in judo are pins and arm locks. Sankakus are great, but arm bars work most of the time. Kimuras, everyone keeps on saying, I don't think it is, but Kimura is always, oh, it's a power move. It's a power, you have to be strong to, to do a Kimura. I don't think so. I think Kimura is more of a technique move personally. That's me, mm -hmm. but that's because I like doing Kimuras. And it might be because of my wrestling background, because in wrestling we have a similar move to Kimura to pin somebody. But I know it's tough, but you have to go consistency. And I know in that other, another part of the article, the guy talks about developing his style or his way of fighting. And mm -hmm. to me, I, that's something I always tell people. I teach techniques, but to the advanced class, I teach them from different angles and different ways because you're going to figure out which one works best for you. And that kind of is a, is a, your, is a you, I want, it's a your problem. You have to figure out your style and what you like to do and what works best for you and your body type. I can give you all the tools in the world, but it, you have to figure it out. I can't tell you to fight my way. My way works for me. Anthony's way is not going to work for me. Okay. So I feel I like, a little yeah, I agree with that right there. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. I feel like most people don't realize that they have to take control of their own training and development until like probably mm. late brown belt or black, even black belt levels. They don't realize like, really, I need a, I, I personally feel like it's that most of the time people just do whatever the sensei tells you, or mm -hmm. I only learned these techniques. So I'm just going to pick one of those that I learned. It's like, okay, what about the rest mm -hmm. of the, like we said, like over a hundred techniques, like, are you yeah. just going to pick out of the ones that you taught in like, or go, like the big major throws, like just cause they're higher percentage. Oh yeah. We yeah. Cause most people are just going right? to, yeah. Cause most are just going to mimic what their teacher teaches. Most of the time your teacher's going to teach you what they like and what works for them. That's where I try to be different. And I show some things that I'm not super good at. The only reason I got really good at Uchimata is because everyone kept on asking me Uchimata. I was a Tayatoshi Harayagoshi guy, okay? I used to drop Seonagi's crazy when I was younger. But because when I got higher ranks, like Sensei Wan, can you teach me um, Uchimata? I was like, shit, I'm not that good at Uchimata, but I have to learn it because everyone wants to do it. We went through uh, what's Raging Storm, Thunderbolt, what, which one was that one we went through one time? Um, Yamarashi. 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 I know it. Yeah. I know it enough to teach, to show to people and to help them figure it out, but it's not one of my main throws, but I had to learn it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think as a higher black, as a black belt person, you need to know these things, especially if you're going to start teaching because not everything that I do is going to work for you. I love doing cross step Tayatoshi, but not everybody out there is going to be, oh, do cross step Tayatoshi. If you have short legs, you ain't doing cross step Tayatoshi, all right? <laughs> I'm sorry, you can't. I'm going to teach you drop Seonagi or something. If you're a shorter guy, you ain't doing Uchimata, but you might be able to do Harayagoshi, and I could teach you that, okay? Or yeah. instead of like teach you, you feel weak and scared about doing Ippon Seonagi, like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to let go of the gi. Sorry, that's cool. I'll teach you Murota Seonagi, you know? On the opposite end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. um, 
in we I when I in my old dojo we had a is it's like near our university which gets a lot of international students mm-hmm. and we had this guy come train with us who came from Korea mm-hmm. and I told you this this before and he was like I've only done he only knows drop sail and again mm-hmm. drop drop sail away I, I'm not even call sail and again drop <laughs> sail toshi right okay he only knows drop sail away toshi mm-hmm. that's the only thing he knows he's like my sensei looked at me and was like oh your body build you're just gonna do this throw. This is the only throw you're going to do. Mm-hmm. And then he might know some combinations or setups going into that, that throw, mm-hmm. but that's the only throw he knows. And he told me he hated judo when he was in Korea. Ah, and I think he actually stopped training once he went back because mm-hmm. he gave his belt and his gi away to a friend in our dojo. And I think he never trained again once he walked up back to Korea oh, because that's so he sad. didn't like it was being taught there. Oh. but it's a high per- that's how they teach in korea it's like a high percent like like a high percentage throw your sensei mm-hmm. says if you want to win matches then you learn to throw and just get really freaking good at it mm-hmm. and that's all he did and the only reason he started training again is because he studied abroad and went to a judo club and he's like oh there's all these other throws mm-hmm. judo is actually more than just this one technique <laughs> so yeah so that's the opposite end of the spectrum of what we're talking about no it is true like that's when you get to schools or like we talked about you asked before what's the measurement for a for a good school and depends on what the teacher Mm -hmm. the sensei or the community center or whatever is running the program what they find successful now do they find having a bunch of students as successful me having a flourishing like i have a hundred students is that successful or that i have five national competitors or one olympian our, our dojo, mm-hmm. our dojo, our dojo, mojo, dojo, our dojo itself to me, I think does very well because we have national competitors. We have a lot of people that have won at winter nationals, summer nationals, USA nationals. We have people that compete internationally. We have people that compete in local tournaments. We have people that are recreational. We have people that are very serious. So us, and like you said before, for people in LA, we have tons of adults. We're not a kids program that has like a bunch of kids and like two parents teaching. We have adults, we have teens, we have little, little kids, tiny, tiny little five-year-old kids that are adorable doing judo because they're so small. And to me, that's successful. And to build that, that is even more successful. And I would love to have an Olympian, you know, that would be great to have on our roster. Look, we have an Olympian here. That's a great, but it depends on what the dojo with the with the head sensei, the community center, the instructors, how they measure their success, and that's just what it comes down yeah. to. And if and you want that, yep, yeah. So if basically if you're looking for a dojo, you have to ask yourself like, what do I want out of it? Do I want to win medals? Like if you want to win medals and go mm-hmm. to a super competitive dojo, you might be doing the same throw a billion times, and you might be mm-hmm. completely trash at like knowing the other throws right but that's what <laughs> yeah. the trade-off yes yeah, so that that's something that you just have to ask yourself um so i don't want to make the episode too long so we should move on um yeah what's the next one what's the next thing going down yeah so so the next thing is they talk about what in that common thread and also add on to what we said about wrestling is People were like, oh, yeah, when I learned JKD, Jeet Kune Do, or some other martial arts, they have us like, let's say I've never learned before. I call them like, hey, I've never done judo before. I want to sign up for martial arts. And they'll be like, oh, you got to wait until the next beginner's class start. Mm-hmm. So basically, in their curriculum, you talked, uh, Juan, you talked about a back to basics class that you want to, uh, that we can start teaching, yeah. right? Once, Assume, assuming we lose beginners and we don't have that as big of a class yeah. of beginners, you're going to have back to basics class. So basically you have, they, they have a back to basics or fundamentals class every month at the beginning, first week of every mm-hmm. month. And they basically tell this guy, if they called in the middle of the month, you got to wait until the next beginner uh, back to basics class start. Mm-hmm. That's when you start. So you have everyone start at the same level. What do you think about that? Cause um, the dojo near me, is where my house is they don't really have that for adults but for kids they teach in a semester based system mm-hmm. so they have session one session two and they have this whole like thing planned out like we're going to learn break falls first week and this and this is very structured mm-hmm. do you think that would work in bj not not just bjj but judo like it's i totally get that because that's how i learned karate like they had sessions they had four sessions mm-hmm. a year four quarters a year and that's also how you got tested for things in my karate growing up uh, my thing with judo and especially with us at our dojo, we don't, 
it's kind of like when someone's interested, you're like, oh, they're interested. Let's catch them. Let's bring them in. Don't lose them. Because you're scared that if you tell someone, oh, we're, we're going to start a beginner's class in next month. Or we start the beginner's class at the first week of each month. We start a new beginner's class. Some other place. They're going to sign yeah. up somewhere else. They're going to go to a BJJ school, a judo school, a catch wrestling, whatever. They want to do grappling. Someone else will take them. And you're worried about that. So that's the one thing why we don't do it in judo. And to, to go back to why like, I don't want to tell people like, oh, I'm going to get rid of the beginner's class once it's done. It's my worry. And it's always worry mm-hmm. all the time that not everyone's going to survive judo. And I'm trying right now to make it that we will retain these beginners, but they are going to go up to the advanced class sooner or later. Once they get their orange and green belts, we will go to the advanced class later. And if we don't continuously get an influx of new white belts that want to join judo, I don't want to lose this program of me, of me personally doing the Saturdays. And what I would turn it into is turn it into a back to basic class. And what I mean that is that it's open to anybody from black to white to everybody to come in on Saturdays and we work on back to basic things, work on Iponsonagi, Ogoshi, Tayatoshi, work on the basic fundamentals again. Because sometimes in advanced class, you don't get that. But you teach a combination and you expect people to know it. Or it's like one of those days, like, it was one of those days where you're, the sense is just, okay, work on your favorite technique. And we work on our favorite technique for an hour or 45 minutes, work on a combination. And then, okay, run Dory, last 45 minutes of class. So if we do a back to basics, that's something I'd like to do. If, if I cannot continue with the beginner's class, if we lose people, I don't want to stop this. I want to get people to come back. Cause I've had people ask me about a back to back to basics or learning beginner stuff again. So that's my thing right there. But with the sessions, you just don't want to lose people. That's just any dojo sphere. Even though we're a nonprofit, we still don't want to lose mm-hmm. people. We want to keep the influx of people yeah. coming in at any time. And that's the biggest thing with that. And I guess if you're a super popular sport like BJJ, you could be able to do that, that we start new sessions. Like we have a winter session, a spring session, a fall session, summer. You can do that. But it's if people are interested. And since judo is not super popular, it's not – people aren't clamoring for judo classes. That's where you got to take people when they come in. Yep. Totally agree. So I, I think, like you said, that's probably the reason why a lot of these places don't do it unless they're like the only BJJ or only judo <laughs> place in a suburb within like a hundred mile radius, then you could probably afford to do that. Right. Mm-hmm. But if you have like all these competitions around, then you probably want to get them started, get the ball rolling. Well, um, their motivation because some, some people um, I know a lot of people that are shy or um, they have anxiety about mm-hmm. taking group classes with a bunch of strangers mm-hmm. and it takes a lot of courage for them to make that call or email to be like I want to change myself I want to do something healthy and mm-hmm. gain confidence and stuff so i'm going to make that phone call and then you tell them yeah come by next month like yeah it's like oh like, next month I, kinda, by then they'll leave yeah. they'll be like oh i'm gonna take knitting classes instead yeah, then, you know? and by, <laughs> yeah by the next month they, they might not have that same thought or they might be like oh you know what maybe that maybe i should just like stay home or maybe yeah. it's not for me yeah they, yeah so it we we want to that so i i see pros and cons to the both approaches basically mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So one other thing someone mentioned was, um, basically have a, I, I want to go into one of this, uh, learning model that I've been reading a bit a lot about. It's called like a, a flipped classroom or reverse classroom. Mm-hmm. And I first heard about it from this podcast called BJJ mental models. And it's actually episode what episode is this episode 110 so if you guys are listening are curious go listen to that episode um they basically have a bjj uh school that started using reverse classroom model and apparently he's the pioneer for it he didn't invent the reverse classroom model but um he's one of the first bjj places to do it i think and um well he's just taking credit for it let's start with (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they've done it in universities and in med school. So there's a lot of research and trials that's happened in the academic uh, sphere, not, not so much the martial arts sphere. Right. So essentially, usually the traditional model is the teacher teaches something in school and then you have homework and you go home and you practice it at home by doing homework. Right. And that's how you retain the knowledge. This reverse or flip model is actually doing the opposite. Basically, you introduce new ideas and concepts 
at home that the student will look, read or look at. So think about mm-hmm. like reading a textbook or watching a judo video about how to do a sotogari or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you come to class with questions and details. Okay. And uh, the, the pro of this is that you save a lot of time going o- over fundamentals that everyone has to circle up around. And basically the cl- whole class stops to watch you do this demonstration when everyone can just watch this video at home. Right. Then they come to class mm-hmm. and you're like, okay, today we're going to do a sotogari or for another thing you could do is it helps divide up the class. So if you have white belts that need to learn break falls and you have them watch a break fall video at home and they're going to start working on break falls. And if you have this mm-hmm. other corner where, green belts are working on Uchimata, then you have them start working on Uchimata. And then another corner would do Osotogari and do Osotogari. And you as an instructor go around watching them and helping fix stuff. And if they have questions, they come ask you. So this kind of helps people of different levels, kind of like we said, um, what do you, uh, take control of their own learning process. Mm. And you can kind of guide them in a way for, so maybe a green belt, you're not going to tell them what you need to learn, but you'll be like, okay, in order to get your brown belt, you need to know these throws. I don't care what order you learn them at. Mm-hmm. Cause maybe one person learns Ushimata really fast, but he gets really stuck on, he's a guru or something. Right. Then mm-hmm. he would like spend one week in Ushimata and spend three months on he's a guru. Mm-hmm. So this allows that kind of flexibility and you can have a wider array of, uh, um, different levels of people. Uh, so that's the, it, it gets more complicated than that. So if you're interested in it, just go, go look it up. Um, but that's the gist of the reverse classroom model. And for BJJ, this guy basically pre-records a bunch of these videos of the basics about um, what the goal of passing of BJJ is like passing guard, retaining guard, open guard, close, what a closed guard is, what is side control, what is cross face. So they have all these fundamentals and mm-hmm. he has a sheet that tells a white belt to go through these things. Then they come to class with questions, right? And when you force people to come up with questions, you're forcing them to think about stuff versus just doing it. And that apparently helps them retain knowledge better. And there's a lot of research actually um, backing this. Mm. So do you have any thoughts on that? What about what I just explained so far? No, I think it's interesting. I think anything that's going to try to improve teaching, as long as not harming their learning Mm -hmm. is good because with judo, I think we have more of a structural, a structured base of how we teach and how we do things because we're an Olympic sport. Sport and you know we're regulated by IGF that things regulated by USC Judo blah, blah blah all the way down to us Tanaka to was like that there's um there's things that are out there to help us teach like even when we what we talked about last year the American Judo system thing that came out that we talked about yep. there's there's yep. that for Judo there's things out there for Judo we go to coaching clinics that tell us how to teach and how to improve our classes where BJJ since it's more of an independent system like there's other like there are federations like the IBJJF and all that. I don't know if they give them like booklets or curriculum to to help them teach. So there's that old mentality of when I grew up and Gracie Jiu Jitsu became popular. Okay. After the first UFC, Gracie Jiu Jitsu became popular. You would see these Gracie places pop up or you would hear about them. You read them like in Black Belt Magazine or the other commercial magazines that you would just be cannon fodder. You would go there, they beat you up. They, you would just get wrestled by them. You get jujitsu by them. They was it all this stuff. And you expect to learn through osmosis. And you would hear that a lot. And I think that system kind of stayed in the place that there wasn't a set system. Like, okay, guys, we're going to teach passing guard into arm bars. That that's what you hear about. I never, when I took BJJ back in the day, it was kind of like that whole thing where you'd learn one thing at a time and it's up to you to try to chain them together. But with this mm-hmm. person trying to teach stuff, a new way to kind of come up with a system that it all works together is interesting to me because it's something different. You don't hear about that a whole lot with BJJ where you do with judo because we have systems in place. We have coaching clinics and tournaments where they tell us what we should teach, what we shouldn't teach, how they expect us to do things. So I have no problem with it. As long as it works, and it's not harming people. Why not try it out? And if your students yeah. are retaining this knowledge and getting it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, the way that we're teaching is still, I mean, obviously the way that most places teach has changed over the years. Right. But I still, for the most part, it matches what, how they would teach is teach like a hundred years ago. I think it's still mm-hmm. pretty much the same, do this, do this, and then rendori. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and I think it should there should be we should be ex- be more uh experimental and adventurous and trying out different ways of teaching because I th- always I think there's always a better way of doing something there's always improvements and that's that's the engineer the software engineering me continuous improvement right mm. and yeah. like we, we like we mentioned before back then people trained judo all the time and i mentioned like if you didn't show up to class your sensei would go to your house and drag you to class right um <laughs> well yeah because you have judo in school yeah. you can go to <laughs> yeah yeah that that's just that doesn't happen anymore the world's changed and the the way that you teach has to change too and you can see this in our school public school system and um just in general has changed too how we teach math has changed how we teach uh science has changed so why not for martial arts too because of the changing times and people's um interests and people's uh athleticism has changed people are more fat now especially in america and also just people's attention span right there's so many things that are distracting people nowadays Mm -hmm. and telling someone to sit there and just watch you demonstrate something and pay attention the whole time for five minutes is uh, hard. And also when you go to class, I can, I can ask you to show it one more time, right? If I was like, I didn't see that part clearly since so like, can you show it one more time, mm-hmm. but I'm wasting like 10 other people's time. I don't want to say wasting their time, but in, in, a, in a sense, you're forcing 10 other people to watch it. But with this one, if I didn't see something clearly, I can replay it at home mm-hmm. in my own time as many times as I want. And I can slow it down, like slow motion, zoom in, all that kind of crap, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and this is something that was only possible with the uh, introduction of technology. Like there was no colored video back then <laughs> and there's no internet. Right. So yeah. they had to teach something in a different way back then. And one example would be Kata. Kata was a way of passing down knowledge before there was video, um, recording. Mm-hmm. And that's, Kata is still important. I'm not going to de- delve into Kata discussion, but Kata is still important. <laughs> but because of the time, the way that um, things have changed over time, I think we should explore different ways of teaching. Mm-hmm. And a lot of senseis are afraid of trying stuff because what happens if it doesn't work? Yeah. Right. Well, it's the what happens if you try it this new thing? It doesn't work. Yeah. It's the what happens if it doesn't work. Or the most thing is because especially if it's a for profit dojo, it's like, what if I lose my students? Yep. What if they don't like this? And yep. like, I don't like this. This is too different. I'm going to go to another dojo. I'm going to go over here to this other place. So, yep. yeah, it's a big it's a big um, jump of fear for the sensei or the instructor at that time, or even the community center dojo, whatever you're working from to be like, OK, we're going to do this more scientific method. Oh, shit. It didn't work. We lost half our students. Oh, but the ones that stayed, they got really, they got a lot better. I don't give a shit. We lost half our students. We lost half our revenue. Yep. So that's like the bigger yep. leap. That's a bigger question. Yep. It's, uh, it's also like, other than that, in order for stuff like this to work is that you need a feedback loop. That's what we call in software engineering, like a feedback mm-hmm. loop. People have to be able to provide feedback. Like you can't just be like, I think that worked fine. I th- like you're going to have biases yourself, right? Mm-hmm. So you need to track metrics to see how much students am I retaining? Uh, how much improvement did this uh, student get? Maybe he's learning these throws really fast, really well, right? Maybe he's winning more mm-hmm. medals. I don't know what met- whatever metrics you decide on your own. And you, the, the main thing is you have to ask the students for feedback. How many senseis do you know ask, the sense, uh, ask their students on feedback on their teaching? While you're right. teaching, it's excuse like, me, everybody. Think- How did you guys like that Ipul Sonagi? Did everybody did everybody enjoy that Ipul Sonagi? <laughs> <laughs> maybe not while not, maybe not while you're teaching, but maybe like once a year, once a year, once a, every three months, and be like, hey. I want to hear what you thought of my teaching. Like, how can mm-hmm. I improve? But most senseis are like, this is the way I teach. If you don't like it, go find another dojo. <laughs> go, like, go somewhere else. <laughs> um, I do see sometimes like at our dojo, we'll ask each other. It's mostly like high ranks like each other. Like, so what do you think of today's yeah. class? What do you guys like? And I'll ask sometimes, like I asked Matt yesterday, hey, Matt, since you're an advanced yeah. student, you came to the beginner's class. Did you learn anything from this? Did you get anything out of it? And he's like, yeah, there, there's little things you taught again that I forgot that help refresh my memory. It's like, okay, yeah, do this. 
The worst thing though, is you do something like that and you get one of your lazier students being like, yeah, well, I didn't like working that hard. There's too much. And they was, uh, well, that, they were that's on the me thing too with much. Feedback. Like, ah, you have to filter it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have to filter that crap. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I filter. Oh, I didn't like falling so much. So it's like, fall, you're in judo. <laughs> what else are you going to so, do? <laughs> I also think people will tend to not want to offend the sensei when they, they, uh, mm-hmm. well, you, first of all, you need a thick skin in order to do this. Right. <laughs> but, um, Anthony, people don't want to I'm offend the actor. sensei. I've heard everything there is. Okay. <laughs> I've heard everything there is to my face. All right. I've heard yeah. some really mean stuff. All right. <laughs> so if you have a thick skin and I think you want feedback, maybe just like s- s- put up a, a little comment box where people can anonymously <laughs> drop off like feedback. And I'm sure there's going to be little trolls notes. out there. They're like, I think your mustache looks dumb. Like, you know, what? thick stuff like what? that. You don't like my mustache. <laughs> Since they wanted to dumb gi. Oh, 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 he said I had dumb gi. Or the, it's actually funny because we, we did have a little bit of comment box and this is back to Hollywood judo. Uh, someone many, many years ago that didn't have a good experience, didn't enjoy their time at Hollywood judo, wrote us a horrible um, message on Yelp, was it? That's the message on Yelp that saying that Yelp. Yeah. we tell bad jokes, that we smell bad and that we just beat them up. And it's like, no, I, I was like, I think I know who you are. And it's one of those guys that just wanted to push himself too hard, too fast and end up getting hurt after you tell him like, no, don't go to the advanced class. Don't do this. Well, I'm going to do it anyways. Mm-hmm. And then they get beat up and just said that we tell yeah. bad jokes and we smell bad. <laughs> that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. You're going to obviously get bad comments, but you just like, like you said, you're a white belt. You don't know what the hell is, what's correct and what's not and what's good for you for the most mm-hmm. part. Right. But those sometimes amongst even when people when some of the comments even though they're wrong like they might give you some sort of insight into certain things that you, mm-hmm. you might not actually know about you know so mm. um feedback box okay. yeah feedback box mm. <laughs> yeah. put that in the back of the locker room hmm whose handwriting is this i'm gonna go through all the paperwork when they signed up mm, who wrote this <laughs> yeah so given that bjj is less uh kind of like traditional compared to judo i think they don't have like a structure mm-hmm. and they don't have like a what do you call like a central governing structure kind of thing mm-hmm. i feel like they're more free free to try out stuff like this so mm-hmm. if anyone out there teaches judo differently and you have your own experience please like send us a message and let us know what your experience is like because i'm i'm super curious personally love um, to hear about it and yeah as far as i know I only can, I only know like there's the high school like program, super co- like college programs and um, really competitive schools. And then there's like the recreational style. But if there's anything else you guys teach differently, then I'd, I'd like to know and uh, exp- do some research on it. And if you have some data to back it up, that'd be great. Um, anything else before I move on to the last thing I want to talk about? Yeah, move on to the last one. Let's see what we got. What, what's up next? All right. So the last thing I want to talk about is uh, I actually saw this on Reddit a while ago too, but I, I dove into like a lot of deep reading a rabbit hole in Wikipedia and research articles about this, but it's a uh, block versus random practice. Ah, so, yes. Um, yes. Block. Yeah. So block practice is when you, I, I told you about this yesterday. Block practice is when you practice like for basketball example, if we use basketball as an example, um, shooting a free three throw from a, free throw line like a hundred times. That's a block practice. You're doing the same thing over and over and over again. Or if you're playing golf, you're like the driving range, going to a driving range, like mm-hmm. top golf or something like that. That's example of block practice, right? Random practice is if you were to shoot, I tell you to go to a random spot to shoot the basketball hoop there every each time, every single time, each time. So that's random. Yeah. Yeah. So the studies show that random practice in the long term, helps you retain knowledge and uh, you get better skills in the long run compared to block practice. Mm-hmm. So one mini study they did was they told someone to do a certain task. I, I forgot what task it was, but they told one group to do the same thing over and over again. And another group, they're going to make it a little variable on where you had to like, uh, I think it was like swat, swat something off a of something or to touch something. And when the light turns on, I think it was a, that, that mm-hmm. was the task. And by the end of the first session, the block practice people 
outperform their random practice. But mm -hmm. when they come back the next day and tell them to do the same thing again, the block practice people's performance dropped right off. Hmm. So they, they basically forgot everything that they, they did the previous day. Mm -hmm. While the random practice people kind of saw a little improvement. Okay. And then over like a two week period, the random practice people eventually outperformed the block practice people. Mm -hmm. So you, this is a great study for judo, I think, because um, randori, you can argue, randori is Brandon practice. But then, the, you know, a lot of dojos make you do tons and tons and tons and tons of uchikomi. Mm -hmm. That to me is block practice. Okay. And I well, think do you mean, a combination of both is important. Okay. Now, for me, just from when we talked about this before, it seems to me, Yes, Rondori, like if you do martial arts, you got to do Rondori. If you're a martial artist that doesn't do yeah. Rondori, you're kind of just, you're not learning anything because you can't show your, how you're going to use it. You're not actually doing what you're learning. Yeah. So to me, from what your study told me is that, so block practice to me would be like when you tell, you demonstrate a throw, like, okay, we're doing Ippon Sunagi. Mm -hmm. And you just stand as your partner and you stay stationary and you just do Ippon Sunagi. Where block mm -hmm. training to me would be more like how we say, okay, now do it moving around. So either moving in circles, yes. steps diagonally, using the four dimensions of judo that I like to use, what I like to say and stuff, four dimensions of judo, moving around and doing it. And so that would be your random, your uh, other style when you're random, when you're talking mm -hmm. about. So I think to me, uh, it has to be a mixture of both of them, but mm -hmm. I think you have to start stationary because it's yes it's tough enough to get people to do footwork like doing pulling each mm -hmm. like what a lot of jojo do though you see them just do pulling each all the way to the, end of the mat and then throw the person mm -hmm. if i if i taught somebody and expect them to start walking with it immediately they're going to be tripping all over themselves and not knowing what to do yep so i think that starting off block is good and then go into the randomized mm -hmm. In my opinion, I think that would work because that's what I've seen in judo yeah. work. Even the same thing in karate. When you warm up, you stand in one spot, you do all your kicks, you do all your punches, and then you do like walking drills. You're kicking down the line or kicking one way, another way, then jab cross another direction. So, yeah, let me let me unpack that a little, a little bit. <laughs> I agree with you, but the question uh, is, how do you mix it to, right? How do you mix so, it? Okay. Given if someone's never done judo before, then yeah, mm -hmm. block practice, right? Got to yeah. teach them the footwork, teach them the entry. But a lot of people are like, a lot of senseis are like, you're not ready for moving yet because you can't mm -hmm. even do the standing correctly. But mm -hmm. there's actually a bunch of people out there that think like you should start doing random practice no matter how shitty your, your, your block practice, your Uchikomi is. Mm -hmm. Even if your Uchikomi is terrible, you need to start incorporating random practice early. And it's going to look terrible. That's, that's the, that's the key point of this discussion and this study mm -hmm. is that it will look terrible, mm -hmm. but in the long run, you'll see value in it. They'll retain the knowledge better, even oh, yeah. though it looks terrible, but most mm -hmm. people don't. And they ask the question, why don't most wrestling coaches or most more um, other coaches, basketball coaches, volleyball coaches, why don't they do this? It's because at the end of practice, if you end with a random practice like that session, one, the athlete feels like shit because they can't, do it properly with the right. Uh -huh. Like if, for example, if our, if we ended the practice telling you to, okay, now do a Sotogari moving and no, no one can do it, then they're going to leave feeling shitty and they might not come back. Mm -hmm. And it's like uh, motivation and morale is just a really important part of learning. Right. So that's yeah. one, one thing. Another thing is that the coach's ego, right? Cause if the athlete doesn't finish the, they're not able to do the movement that the coach feels like they didn't do a good job, but if mm -hmm. you have them do block practice and they eventually get the static thing working, then they're like, Oh yeah, I, my teaching was good because they were able to do it. But then the next practice comes and they're not able to do it again. So it's like, yeah. Um, what kind of <laughs> mix, do, what kind of mix do you think is good? And I personally think you should have like what, one thing that a lot of places do is they end the practice with throwing lines, which is what Sensei Philippe does. Mm -hmm. And I love that because yeah it ends on a positive note. You get to throw people, no matter how shit your mm -hmm. technique is, you get to throw people and it kind of feels like a success in a way and in the practice that way. And mm -hmm. which is why I think the perfect mix is 
block practice, like st- static Ushikomi, mm-hmm. and then moving Ushikomi, and then move into just moving, circular moving, just uh, not exactly throwing people. Maybe mm-hmm. maybe if they, le- they know how to fall, then it's like what we call French Randori, like Yakusoku Geiko. Yeah. Um, pre- take turns, taking French falls, Randori. like but with movements. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> That might not be the most uh, people will mess up, right? But mm-hmm. you need to start getting that that sense into them, make them start problem solving, thinking to retain this knowledge, and then finish off with the throwing lines to mm-hmm. like make them feel good about themselves. That's uh, how I think. No, uh, I, I like to apply I like this we, this research. Yeah, no, I like the way thinking, and I do believe that if you're not <laughs> if you're not doing moving Uchikomis within your first month of judo or by the end of your first month of judo, then you're, you're being taught too slowly. I think like me, I have plans for hope maybe next week to start teaching moving Osotogadis. So that's the first throw they learn to do. And I'm not going to teach them like three dimensional moving where they're going in a circle and stuff. I want to start doing the first, the line pulling. So you're going to pull the person down, which I started this week already with teaching people how to mm-hmm. open up the gi. And I saw people were having trouble with that for, for Ogo, she says like, all right, back to basics, guys. We got to not dumb it down, but we got to bring it down a level. Now we're going to do pulling Shikomis, opening up the person and moving them. And then after they did that, like um, four or six times going back and forth doing that, I had them mm-hmm. go back to regular Ogo, she's standing and it helped them out. They're like, okay, now I get that feeling of the pool. So it has to be a good mixture, but yeah, you have, especially in judo, you have to start moving with them. I think sooner than later like you don't want to be just standing there doing iposonagi or ogoshi standing yeah. for six months that's not judo no one's gonna stand yeah. for you right there and wait for you to do it i think that's um <laughs> yeah. me and my friend matt were talking about that one time of how um some people are really good doing the throw standing just standing uchikomis but then when it's the mm-hmm. time to start moving around using the dimensions around you moving around going in circles blah blah blah, blah, blah. oh no i can't do anything I can't step in. I can't step out. I can't yep. do it. It's because they don't do it moving enough. So yep. yeah, it has to be a good balance, but yeah, I, yeah, think, I think you have to do both, but at the beginning you got to do standing. Yep. Yep. I think uh, the more, the more green you are, the more beginner you are, the more static Uchikomi you need to do. And as you get more advanced, the balance kind of shifts more time mm-hmm. spent on the movements yeah. and even the moving straight line Ushikomi, I think you should stop doing that at one point and just do a free moving, free f- flowing Ushikomi practice. Mm-hmm. Like that I think is more uh, valuable after a certain point. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I only have one more question for you is, um, right. go, uh, Shoot, let's fin- go let, let you finish uh, your point. No, my thing was just to be standing to Chikomi. Once you get to like brown belt or higher, it should just be warm up. Or if you're really going to dissect something down and figure out how to do it. But if you're just doing standing, it should be combinations. It shouldn't just be just yep. doing a throw inside. You should be practicing your favorite technique. You should be dissecting your favorite technique. But yeah, standing should just be warm up. You shouldn't be, even though, you know, we're really tired. So it's like, all right, let's just do some standing. Just go me. I'm beat. And I don't want to do nothing else right now. <laughs> so go ahead. Yeah. If you go look at like, if you go look at the Japanese national team, do what you call me. They're not doing mm-hmm. even doing. They're just kind of like, yeah, they just, just do like stepping. Doing it as a warm up, they're, they're not even. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just stepping. They're you just know, moving their feet. Judo two step, one in, yeah. one out, one in, one out, one in, one out. <laughs> they're not even doing it properly, and that's it's a different purpose <laughs> to what you call me. And yeah, I totally mm-hmm. agree. Um, the one question I have for you is that you talked about how next week you pretend um you're ready to start teaching which moving which call me what happens if we have like new mm-hmm. people sign up like going back to like our previous what we were talked about like an hour ago yeah it's like if they sign up well like, how the one thing would in? be yeah well here's my thing with this we're only for for my money we're only three weeks into doing this beginner class that's not that far ahead of teaching somebody mm-hmm. Like today, we had that one gentleman, like, um, so yesterday we had that one gentleman, the Muay Thai guy, that mm-hmm. we started in. He came in late, and I know why he came in late. He probably came in late because he didn't want to do falls. He didn't want to do break falls. That's mm-hmm. why he came in late. I know people do. I ain't stupid, all right? I know the games. I, yeah, I know he did that too. <laughs> all right? Yep. I know the games. So he came in, so he'll be at a point where he can just do Tachiwaza. So I'm not going to dumb down the class. I'm not going to hold everybody at back just for that one person. But if someone comes in, they're brand new, brand new, 
we're going to do the beginning class of everyone falling. We're still going to do the beginning class where I teach everybody how to do Oso Togari again or Ipo Sonagi. And they're going to walk through it. Three weeks is not that far ahead, in my opinion. It's not going to be that far. Like, oh, they're so far behind, they can't do it. I don't feel you have to separate them. Now, if someone came in, if everybody's a yellow belt and there's a brand new white belt in there, then maybe I would divide the class of, okay, let's do all the falls together like we normally do, but we're going to work on Tayatoshi that one person is going to be going to go separate with Anthony or something and work on Osotogari or Ipon Seonagi or Ogoshi. Then I'll separate it. But for right okay. now, if we get somebody that comes in next week, we're all going to do break falling. They're all learning how to move together. So I don't think it's a big deal. It's a big difference, in my opinion. What do you think, okay. Anthony? Yeah, I think that's great. I, I was just curious whether you think it would be a good idea to like, a month from now revisit everything from scratch like we did on the first day of class like yeah. whether that's a plan or or whether it's just like no that was just a one-time thing no it's not it's not a thing okay we did also the guy the first week no more assault the guy for nine months when you teach yeah. beginners it has to be like <laughs> two steps forward one step back or three steps forward one step back when you teach beginners that's just how it is so they retain it and as we get where that bjj guy talked yeah. about we do one kimura and then we don't do it for another six months and it's because there's so many techniques in your advanced class. You want, you want to teach everybody everything. But if you want to do a good, solid beginner's class, in my opinion, it's like three steps forward, one step back. So you're just going back and forth. So they retain this. Because as we know ourselves, yeah. we have those teens. The teens we had were doing so well right before the pandemic. They're doing very good. They're learning mm -hmm. techniques. They had be not beautiful. They had good technique. I want to say beautiful. Good techniques. Then the pandemic happened. They stopped doing geo for like, what, six months, nine months. They came back. They didn't remember nothing. Yep. These kids are just like, oh, remember what's, their names. Yeah. what's Ipun Seonagi? And now they're getting back into it. Their Osotogaris this weekend looked very mm -hmm. good. They look nice. Their Ogoshis look decent, not great, but they look very like, again, they're not going to hurt each other doing well. So does it take time for them to return to um, get this stuff back again? But yeah, you know how it is. I, I think lose stuff. Yeah, I think the key point of the beginner's class in judo, at least, I don't know about the other stuff, but it's not so much about the techniques itself, but giving the students the tools to, like you said before, take mm -hmm. their learning to upon themselves. So they, they're able to learn without much instruction later mm -hmm. on, right? So you need, you need to provide them the tools. And those tools would be ukemi, Kazu, t teaching the concepts of Kazushi and being a good partner, those kind of things. With those things, they can, they'll start piecing things together themselves unless you literally have six brain cells and you might need a little more hand. <laughs> just go to wrestling. You know, just, just go to wrestling. Yeah. Don't, don't bother. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, giving, giving people the tools to actually understand the, the more advanced concepts and uh, learn outside of the dojo. And going back a little bit to the reverse classroom model, I think a lot of people are already implementing that themselves. Like people who get really into judo, they're watching YouTube videos, right? They're like, mm -hmm. I always get people no, sending me YouTube, videos. What, what do you think the, about this? The hottest thing on Instagram? No, yep. you're not good enough for that yet. It's a lot of no. <laughs> yeah, I mean like, I, they'll send me something a lot of times I'll be like, yeah, that's cool and all, but that'll never happen in a competition setting. Like, and, and then they're like, why, why <laughs> yeah. wouldn't, why wouldn't it happen? And it's like, well, I, I don't compete a lot, but I know it's not going to happen because one, I know the rules and two, it's like, I know if your hand goes past this point of the center line or whatever, then th you can counter easily with this or certain things that's not going to happen. Right. You just, you just know, because mm -hmm. you have, once you get, you know, the fundamentals concepts of how things work, then you start seeing why these shit you see on YouTube is not going to work or it's low percentage or high percentage. What, what's really good, what's really bad. So we, the, I think in a sense that people are already doing this reverse classroom model. And if you as a sensei start recording these videos, like if we have a leaf sensei record all his like techniques, then at, at the very least, there's a certain quality control there, right? Mm -hmm. On YouTube, you can see dangerous shit that people are going to try at the dojo or stuff that's like completely useless. So, um, yeah, but that's that's my the thought that I'm going to leave at on uh, regarding this topic. All right. So is there anything else you want to talk about today, Anthony? 
No, this is kind of a long episode, and I feel like it was more like a rant, but <laughs> more of a rant episode about I'm teaching. Glad we said it. <laughs> well, I hope people <laughs> took something from this a way to learn, a way to develop, and why senseis do certain things. And they're not trying to hold you back, they're not trying to be mean to you, they're trying to help you as much as possible because judo is a dangerous sport. Falling on your head, falling on your arm, shit happens. I don't want you to get concussed, I don't want you to break your arm, I don't want you to break your leg. So Back from the beginning, ukemis, okay? Work on your ukemis. So anything else, Anthony, that you want to add? Any more uh, do not try this at home? No. <laughs> All right. Yeah, just do do not try dangerous <laughs> stuff at home. Yeah, or don't <laughs> try YouTube stuff at your dojo. All right. So please, everybody, like, share, and subscribe. You can follow me on Instagram at the jira underscore one. You can follow Anthony at Anthony Throws on Instagram. You can follow the channel itself on Instagram at Tatami Talk. You can follow us on YouTube at Tatami Talk. Um, we also put out some short form videos of the Dakeage and uh, Ashigurami explaining why the dangerous moves of judo are dangerous and what can happen. Please check them out. Give us some feedback if you like them or not. You can hit us up on any of our any of our social medias or you can just send us an email directly at the Tommy talk on gmail anthony you have anything left nope i'm good <laughs> he's always good he's got nothing left all right everybody peace out see you next time <laughs>